Good evening. As you can probably tell from my voice, I'm trying to recover from a little bit of laryngitis and a cold. Uh, my wife and I decided to spend Easter in Calgary and see our only three grandchildren, three under four, all in the same household. And when we arrived, uh, they had the cold. And when we left, they still had the cold, but we took it with us. So uh, I uh, usually try to come early to these meetings. And the last time the Charlottetown Tell, I think I left here quarter to 11. I'm prepared to stay as long as you'd like after the formal meeting's over, but I am at, uh, for, for your betterment, not shaking hands. Okay. I'm also um, not going to read the terms of reference and a few other things which have been passed out, but they're worthy of reading, particularly the center section, the first page, points one, two, three, and four. Um, just as a matter of interest, um, how many people have attended one of these meetings before? Okay, thank you. So we're about split. And I'm uh, just going to tell you what I propose to do a little differently this evening, partly in relation to my voice and partly since we have uh, several groups and organizations have indicated that they would like to make uh, presentations. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to read any of the, this. I'm not going to make many opening comments. I'm going to try to uh, restrict some gratuitous comments during the course of the evening and uh, will uh, indicate that uh, I have have read reports and I will be thoroughly reading them after as well that I'm impressed by the sincerity and the quality of all documents have been received, emails and telephone calls and letters and so forth. It's been really quite impressive and uh, just confirms what I already knew that uh, people in Prince Edward Island are deeply concerned about their land and it reflects in what I call pride of place. Tomorrow night, we are at Englewood School in Crapple at 7 o'clock until 9.30 plus. Um, that is uh, a storm uh, makeup. And then this Wellington, Wellington Center, Vanier Center, this coming Saturday, the same thing, a makeup at 2 p.m. to 4.30, and you'll determine how late you'd like to go tonight, but uh, normally when we have a good flow in the evening, we quite often go to quarter to 10, 10, and then spend some in-time formal time afterwards. So, um, this gentleman over here is from Kensington. His name is Evan McDonald. He works with the provincial government, and he is a geographer. Now, I'm sure that um, you would think of many positions that would occupy the provincial uh, civil service, but a geographer, I would say that uh, you would not put that down your top 10. However, it's a very interesting job this young man has. Started as a summer school student a couple of years ago. And I've asked him tonight to give us two 3D flyover presentations. The first one is of North Rustico area, and the other one is of the East Point area. And what that will show along the coastline, the area of lands in this province that are owned by non-residents of Prince Edward Island. And you can tell that area by it's the shaded area in rosy red. And uh, so we're going to do that in a couple of moments. And as soon as uh, that little presentation is over, then we're going to hear from um, these four groups. And I had made a decision, as I think I indicated someplace, that, uh, and if you haven't picked it up, I read by taking my glasses off, that um, those organizations that have already made informal comments at previous meetings, I'm hearing from you a little later. And um, two groups that we haven't formally heard from in the sense of making comments at a public meeting, the Food Security Network and the Council of Canadians, followed will be by the National Farmers Union. We've heard from the union on a fair number of occasions and followed by the Federation of Agriculture and we've heard from them on an equal number of occasions. Um, the uh, question was asked to King Cora 
have I met with a particular farm organization privately, and I said that I was a speaker at the Federation of Agriculture. Uh, TV cameras were rolling, and uh, a whole bunch of press were there, and, and so forth. I am uh, speaking this coming Thursday at noon at the National Farmers Union, and they were kind enough to uh, change their date to permit me to spend Easter Monday in Calgary, and for that I uh, am very appreciative. I don't know, Edith, if you have the cameras rolling at lunchtime or not, the media, but uh, I'm looking forward to being present. So um, having said that, it's been uh, a turnout that has varied all across the province, and we have now had hundreds of individuals come out and uh, sometimes you don't get very many, and yet the meeting can be excellent. On other occasions, you have large turnouts, and the meetings can still be excellent. And notwithstanding that, uh, you know, we've had our storms. Um, the Queen was admitted to hospital. We had the first Pope in 700 years decide to retire. And we had an unexpected Pope elected who is uh, kicking up his heels over in Rome by getting rid of the red shoes and so forth making quite an impression, a good impression, I might say. Um, make that comment as a Baptist. And uh, we've had Stomp and Tom Tonners die, and now we have Margaret Thatcher die today, plus there are health organizations going to the province. And um, the media have come to the first couple of meetings, and otherwise they have not. And in my opinion, they have missed fantastic stories that could have filled their print and news night every single occasion. But that's their decision. Okay. So having said that, I'm going to ask Evan McDonald to please do the flyby pass of uh, North Rustico, followed by East Point. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, Horst. So the first video you'll see is uh, starting off between Cavendish and Rustico and uh, flying along uh, the shores around there. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the non-resident properties look like and where they are. Uh, it's a small area, but um, you don't see that stuff from the road. About 23% of the coastline between Cavendish and about Oyster Bed is non-resident owned. So the non-resident properties are showing up there in the red color. As you can see, most of them are right along the coast. You'll notice the difference between this area and the next one I show because these properties are more, there's a lot more subdivision along the coastline. Their average parcel is probably about two and a half acres. So as I mentioned, 23% of the coast there, non-resident owned. So this is starting down at East Point and going all the way up to St. Peter's Bay. 45% of the coastline, and most of these are big properties, over 20 acres usually. So if you were driving along the road along the North Shore there, you wouldn't really know that most of these properties are non-resident owned. The average size parcel up here is, that's non-resident owned is more like 15 acres, so it's quite a difference from Rustico. In most areas on PEI, if you go from Rustico up around Malpec and those areas, the cottage areas, the average size are more like an acre or two, or down here they seem to be a lot larger.
So that's what I have. And we can just close maybe the computer down, uh, Evan, please. And uh, do you find the screen too bright? Would you prefer it be shut off? Or what's the difference? Okay. And now we're going to hear from the PI Food Security Network. I forgot yep. to say that the mics just don't amplify, they also record, and at some point in time, these uh, hearings will be publicized on the website and so forth. I understand eventually all the documents I receive and all of this will hit to the archives, but I'm not quite ready to go to the archives yet. Yep. Please, Marie. Yep. Good evening. My name is Marie Burge, and uh, I'm with the PEI Food Security Network, and uh, other members of the the group that I work with within the Food Security Network, which is the Production and Distribution Working Group. Let's introduce them. I know a couple of them for sure. Thank you. So, with me with me is uh, Don Wilson. So the two of us are presenting, and backing us up are Jane Ledwell, uh, Ridge Fallon and Tony Redden. We have a num couple of uh, other members who couldn't be here. Uh, Hannah, Hannah Hamlin, who had, did a lot of work also with us in the preparation of this uh, presentation. We worked over, over a period of three months in a number of meetings, and uh, this, is the, this is the result of it. What you're getting tonight is, um, is a kind of shortened version because other people have things to say. So. First of all, we want to thank you, uh, Mr. Carver, for accepting to form the Commission on the PEI Lands Commission Act. There, there's a lot of um, excitement about the fact that you were doing this because you did um, remind us of the history of the Act itself and you were there. Um, and also the, the, the way that this was arranged so that you heard the voices of many, many islanders. The Food Security Network was formed in 2008. It represents between 60 to 80 individuals and organizations, including, among others, food producers, as well, individuals affected by lack of food. Uh, the Food Security Network is an education and action organization. We are committed to achieving a just, people-centered, secure food system in Prince Edward Island. We are dedicated to changing community attitudes and public policy in order to promote environmentally appropriate practices for production and distribution of food, the availability of afford affordable, healthy, culturally appropriate, and personally acceptable food for people, and ensuring livable income for producers. The Food Security Network incorporates within its framework an analysis uh, the basis of the worldwide movement of food sovereignty. So we often use the word security and sovereignty interchangeably. The pillars of food sovereignty are the focus of our presentation. We believe that everybody has the right to healthy, available, and affordable food to maintain their life. 
we are adamant that the natural life-giving sources of that food, the land, water, and air, must be protected. Food security for PEI depends on the land and on public policy that makes food security a priority. Policy and legislation must support the critical need to preserve and improve farmland. Legislation must also protect and preserve the health of natural wooded and wetland areas, which are so important for maintaining clean water and clean air. The land, the water, and the air we breathe are under constant threat. Many contradictory interests, the race for instant turning of a dollar, the concentration of power, are making it clear that firm, non-negotiable public policy is required. And probably what we just saw about the negotiation that was uh, possible in PEI with uh, discretionary um, powers in the, uh, in the cabinet to, to allow um, foreign people to take control of land. Like th that's quite shocking to see that in, I was going to say in black and white, but it's in red and green. And uh, so it, it is a, an example. So when we say that we, we want, it, it needs to be firm, non-negotiable. In other words, without uh, these little loopholes, um, so we want to keep emphasizing that. So um, the lobby for increasing land holdings is strong. History tells us that good intentions alone are not enough, and that's what we saw in that other sl those slides. The land, the water, and the air need a strong, loophole-free, tamper-free Lands Protection Act. The nature-based source of our food in PEI cries for legislation which is permanent, strong, and resistant to court action or lack of political will, both of which can happen at any given moment. This food security network submission will address the need for an improved Lands Protection Act from the point of view of the pillars of food sovereignty. The pillars of food sovereignty are focus on food for people, food producers are valued, the need to have localized food systems, the need for local control, the development of knowledge and skills, working with nature, and food is sacred. On the international level, the first six are what are considered to be the six pillars of food sovereignty. It was the People's Food Policy Project in Canada that adopted a seventh pillar. This came as a result of project work with the Aboriginal people. At the outset, it is important to state that the PEI Food Security Network is supporting the analysis and positions of the National Farmers Union and that submission which will be presented tonight. The first pillar of food sovereignty, focus on food for people. This is how we, how we interpreted this, this pillar. Focus on food for people means the right to food must be at the center of the policies related to lands protection, agriculture, and fisheries. In PEI, much of our land is dedicated to food production and food gathering activities. This means that land protection policy must accentuate the right to enough healthy and culturally appropriate food for all islanders in all communities. Lands protection policy must also function in harmony with policy that supports financial, cultural, and social factors in the access to food. Food sovereignty rejects the idea that food is just another commodity or component for international agribusiness. In order to protect our land, to focus on food for people, the language we use for agriculture and fishery policies must change from the language of commodities, exports, markets, 
and acknowledge that food is a necessity, a right even, not a commodity. Yet the Food Security Network does not argue that all available land should be dedicated to food production for people. Even land that is outside food production supports a focus on food for people. Agriculture and the ecosystem are one system. They cannot be rigidly divided from one another. The healthy food that we all require as eaters requires a healthy ecosystem. A healthy ecosystem can include sustainable agricultural practices, and it also values land that is not in farming. Food sovereignty movements around the world, the peasant farmers movement, called Via Campesina in particular, has shown that agribusiness does not feed the world. Instead, it is small-scale peasant farmers, many of whom are women, who feed 70% of the world's population. Looking back over 100 years and looking at PEI's working, lands working landscape and delicate insular ecosystem, it seems a mixture of small and large-scale food production has long been the best mix for island food production. Policy related to the land and sea cannot put the needs of agribusiness ahead of the needs of people, the eaters and the pro food producers. In one context, this might mean protecting the land from development that creates environmental harm and to food producing land. In other contexts, this might mean putting fields for food production ahead of highways to meet the needs of export-driven commodity markets. In yet another context, focusing on food for people might mean protecting land from producing crops for ethanol and other non-food uses. A focus on food for people means food for all people food that is appropriate for children and seniors, from Aboriginal people to newcomers to the island, industrial agriculture cannot support the rich and diverse mix of food that we as a diverse community require. The second pillar of food sovereignty is that this process and, and this, this way of living, which is called food sovereignty, values food producers, supporting both the right to produce food and also the right to sustainable livelihoods for food producers. You will hear a variety of perspectives about how the Lands Protection Act can best support the right to food production and sustainable li livelihood for producers. Some will argue that increasing land limits is the best way to support food producers' livelihood. However, the principles of food sovereignty place the needs of small-scale farmers first as the providers of most of the food that people eat, both internationally and locally. In addition, the PEI Food Security Network looks both at the need for biodiversity and the need for diversity in sizes and types of farms. Agribusiness not only supports the having monoculture, agri agribusiness is itself uh, in the structure, a monoculture. It's a monoculture design. Churning out farms all in one mechanized, technologically dependent, debt-supported economic model. Again, a holistic view of productivity and efficiency is needed. Food prices and farm earnings have not kept pace with expenses for agricultural inputs for highly technological industrial agriculture. No matter how productive farm fields might be, often they are producing more debt than food. Food producers are too often not making the cost of production. 
Many farms across Prince Edward Island are maintained thanks to off-farm income, often by farm women who take jobs to pay the bills and then return home to a second, most times unpaid, work contributing to farm and household labor. For a truer understanding of productivity and efficiency, the land and sea themselves must be treated as having value, that value is natural to them. Land limits support small-scale, organic, high-yield agriculture, where the yield of food per unit of land is high, and the most expensive inputs, inputs are labor, not chemicals and machines. Those limits make sense if we look at efficiency that supports communities, productivity that fills families' plates and inputs and outputs that sustain people, animals, and plants on the land and sea. The industrial system of agribusiness is disconnected, and the strongest sign of the disconnect is when food producers do not themselves have enough income to provide their families' basic needs. It is necessary to rebuild relationships between people and the land. Land ownership has long been a central question for Prince Edward Islanders. Given the enormous debt that food producers must incur to participate in industrial agriculture, there's a terrible risk of returning to a system of land hold holding where land owners effectively own large tracts of land and renters struggle to make payments while they remain unable to meet their family's basic needs. We had 100 years of that. Land limits are part of the legacy of the land struggle, and land limits can be part of the solution to ensuring livelihoods from food production on land and on sea. The third pillar of food sovereignty is that food production should be a localized system. In a localized food system, farmers, fishers, and consumers are better connected and able to have more control over that, what food is produced and how it is produced. The local uh, food market allows farmers and fishers to keep a larger portion of the food dollar. The local consumers get to know more about how their food is grown and how production could affect their health. This should lead to better production, protection of land, air, and water, and it should increase biodiversity. This increase in consumer knowledge should also encourage conservation of the soil through, for example, mixed farming with crops, livestock, and pasture. There is a greater possibility of organic and pasture feed systems with increased carbon stored in the soil and less fossil fuels used to transport food. Good ecological use of the land also has beneficial effects on local rivers and estuaries and the wildlife, fish, and aquaculture that live there. This is all helpful for the long-term sustainable planning needed in our local watersheds and in our local economy. So I'll pass to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the fourth pillar of food sovereignty is local control. The rebuilding of farmer-consumer relationships can be the foundation for vibrant local communities. Local food relationships take many forms, including farmers markets, local stores, and fair trade marketing to uh, restaurants and institutions. Community-supported agriculture is another um, area that's increasing in popularity. In this arrangement, consumers take a more supportive involvement in their food by subscribing to a regular, sometimes weekly, food basket. Urban and community gardens are also becoming popular. Community-supported fishery is another um, local food relationship possibility for PEI. The Lands Protection Act is one example of where islanders exert local control over legislation and policy. The fifth pillar of food sovereignty is farm knowledge and skills development. The family farm has been a central gathering spot for the communication of key farm knowledge and skills between generations. 
In some cases, farm land has been in the same family for generations, which has created an intimate knowledge of the ecological needs of that land. Knowledge and skills, such as crop rotation, use of land, etc., that were cultivated over generations are passed down as children begin working alongside their parents. These practices create an environment where local ecological knowledge is valued, shared, and preserved for future generations. Fewer far family farms exist today than in the past. The Food Security Network is concerned that changes to the land holding limits could result in fewer small-scale family farms by concentrating land in the hands of a few large corporations. Corporate farming prioritizes large-scale industrial farming methods at the exclusion of local knowledge and skills. Another worrisome trend we must consider is the aging population of farmers in PEI. The Food Security Network points out that any changes to the Lands Protection Act in regards to land holding limits will create additional barriers for young people entering farming. Simply put, young people will not be able to compete with well-financed corporations for land. With fewer farms and fewer young people entering farming, the potential exists for valuable knowledge and skills to be lost to future generations. The Food Security Network has found that islanders place a high value on sustainable methods of food production and distribution, methods that work with nature. We maintain that an increase in the land holding limits will result in more large scale industrial farming, which relies heavily on unsustainable farming methods that are harmful to people and nature. While this model of agriculture has been celebrated for its efficiency, efficiency rather, its true costs are staggering in terms of loss of intergenerational knowledge and environmental degradation. Industrial farming forces farmers to compete against one another in the global marketplace. It encourages farmers to abandon traditional forms of food production, such as mixed farming, in favor of specialization in a specific area, resulting in a loss of knowledge and skills Specialization has also resulted in the use of monocrops, which lack biodiversity and depend on the use of synthetic chemicals to produce maximum yields. The sixth pillar of food sovereignty is working with nature. Industrial methods further undermine the crop's ability to adapt to climate change. Food Secure Canada notes that warming Canadian climate will result in previously unseen pests and diseases. Rather than allowing plants to develop their own resiliency to these pests and diseases, industrial farming throws more chemicals their way, perpetuating a cycle of chemical dependency. Additionally, the chemical used in industrial farming leave our water sources vulnerable to contamination, as we have witnessed firsthand on PEI with chemical runoff <coughs> resulting in fish kills and nitrate contamination of groundwater. Industrial farming also contributes to climate change. It utilizes energy-intensive methods that release staggering amounts of greenhouse gas emissions into the environment. For example, the use of large-scale heavy equipment for production and distribution rely on the use of non-renewable energy resources, such as fossil fuels. Taken together, chemical manufacturing, food production, and transportation of food within the industrial food system accounts for as much as 45 to 50 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. In contrast, small-scale farms are more likely to engage in sustainable farming methods that work closely with nature, all the while producing more food than industrial farm methods. Typically, small-scale farmers are more likely than industrial to operate a mixed farm and mixed farming offers many more environmental advantages than industrial farming, including greater biodiversity, increased resiliency, and less reliance on fossil fuels. The presence of biodiversity promotes soil health and increases the potential for crops to develop resiliency to pests, diseases, and a changing climate. The seventh pillar of food sovereignty is food as sacred. It is Canadian Aboriginal people who added this pillar to the food sovereignty framework. When Aboriginal people speak of the sacredness of food, they are not only speaking about the many cultural rituals around food, 
They clearly identify that Aboriginal food systems are a sacred unity of land, soil, water, air, plants, animals, and fungi. Food is sacred because it represents our source of life for thousands of years relating to Mother Earth. They and we believe that food and all its components are not products but a relationship. All lands, foods, medicines, and animals are sacred, and in the universal understanding of the sacred, they are gifts. Aboriginal people uh, originally developed and perfected many of the world's great foods, such as beans, corn, squash, potatoes, berries, herbs, and medicines. They say pointedly that the Western world has never acknowledged this contribution, nor granted any adequate compensation. Instead, they have seen governments supporting large transnational companies to the detriment of indigenous peoples' traditional food production. These governments have acted as though they are justified in appropriating land, water, animals, and plants in Aboriginal territories. Aboriginal people claim the right to collectively possess, control, protect, and pass on the traditional knowledge originating from their lands, which they have developed for centuries, respecting the relationship they have with Mother Earth and looking after the environment. They are the strongest voice in the world for the protection of traditional seeds. They stand against genetic modification of all forms of life which weaken and terminate seeds. Biological diversity lends itself well to tremendous localized abundance of traditional foods. Indigenous people throughout Canada have developed distinct cultures based on traditional harvesting strategies and practices in their respective traditional territories. This is in contrast to the highly mechanized, linear food production, distribution, and consumption model applied to the industrial food system. The PEI Food Security Network is concerned that increases in land holding limits will encourage large scale industrial farming methods, which threaten local knowledge local food relationships, local control over legislation and policy, and the environment. We believe that enough room exists in PEI for both large and small farms. However, our concern is that the amendments to the land holding limits will result in the expansion of larger industrial farms and the decline of smaller farms, creating a severe imbalance with negative consequences for PEI. Based on our discussions with islanders, we believe small-scale farming is the best method to heal the land and produce food in PEI. We caution that any increase in the land holding limits will threaten sustainability of farming in PEI by concentrating land in the hands of a few corporate farms using industrial methods that harm the environment. PEI is a precious ecosystem which must be protected and maintained for future generations of islanders. The Lands Protection Act is one method of encouraging this protection. Therefore, the Food Security Network strongly opposes any amendments to this act which would increase the land holding limits. And we call on you to take this into consideration when making your recommendations. This commission was established to respond to the financial concerns of some PEI farmers. There are other solutions for easing those financial concerns, which don't involve raising the limits on land holdings, and could be much better in the long term for the future of farming in PEI. Many of those solutions and ideas have been brought forward to you at these hearings. Multinational corporate control of our food has led to very tough times for farmers. We believe, however, that islanders have the spirit and the creative resources to find the way to a sustainable food system. The PEI Food Security Network calls on the government of PEI to take the lead with strong action to support and expand sustainable farm practices through extensive programs, and these programs could include land purchase, especially of farmland in ecologically sensitive areas such as riparian zones. Land use planning and zoning, which would include generous compensation to farmers for restrictions on development. 
increase assistance programs for farm labor and fair wages, including youth employment and new farmers. Aggressive promotion and public education to support local production, processing, and trade of foods to replace many foods which are now imported to PEI. Retirement financing programs for older farmers. Protection, promotion, and expansion of supply management programs. Sustaining people, animals, and plants on land and sea. And that concludes uh, the formal part of our presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it's quite apparent to all who have listened tonight, and I have read, and Patrick Carroll here is my scribe, and um, he's poured over this as well, and uh, it's been very thoughtful, um, very, very thoughtful, and uh, very comprehensive, and uh, it makes sound easy to make a report when you have 60 to 80 different groups and individuals. I suggest to you all it does is make it more difficult. And the fact that you've been working diligently over the past three plus months uh, is quite apparent. Uh, some of the things that you suggest in the final there would you like to see in my final report, you know, if sometimes I feel like Santa Claus getting ready in December the 24th to leave the North Pole and put all these things in the sleigh and if I recommended what everybody said, the, the slave wouldn't get off the, the North Pole, Marie. It'd be too heavy. Um, but um, one of the things that you've referred to is you don't want any tampering with the Lands Protection Act and you like to have it loop hole free and things like that. And, you know, the Lands Protection Act has been very fortunate that it was codified in in 1982 into one statute and there's only been one test in the courts and um, that's quite remarkable and it has I think, think sent a signal whether people agree with the signal or not outside of Prince Edward Island what it means and represents. Now some people make the point of view that there's nothing to be changed in the act whatsoever, the implication being it's so perfect. Well, I've been a lawyer for more than 30 years, and I was in the House, and I know that I haven't met a perfect piece of legislation yet. I've tossed this out at a couple of meetings, and it doesn't, to my surprise, has gone nowhere. That forgetting the matter of limits if, for agricultural lands, and forgetting about arable lands for agriculture or people involved in the agriculture community, I guess I am just a little amazed that nobody has wanted to talk about the fact that each resident of Prince Edward Island, and that's uh, 183 days non-consecutive, that they have the right, without Iraq approval and without executive council approval to own a thousand acres of land. And um, you all know I'm a Charlottetown lawyer, although my heritage very much is the firm. But I just don't understand, and I own no land, um, or no shares in a private company that owns land. My wife owns, I've been saying a half an acre, but I think it's really four tenths of an acre in Charlotte, and we have a house on it. It's the land holdings we have. But a thousand acres that I have the right, I'm not a farmer, and none of that, and if any, if I had a thousand acres, I could legally not have it into agriculture production. Seems a lot, and yet nobody comes up at these meetings and jumps on that suggestion that maybe in certain instances the land limits ought to be lowered. Nobody. Marie? Well, we've had a lot of discussion about that because in some of our groups, in some of our groups, we had originally used the language that we wanted the Lands Protection Act to be closed in perpetuity. And the reason for that 
language was at, at first, that we didn't want any, any increase in the land size. And then the discussion became quite, uh, quite animated in that. But we want, we want to get to a day when we will say, yes, we want the act open and we want to decrease the limits because we want to make it more accessible. The land must be more accessible to young and beginning farmers. And so we need to, we need to look to a future when we'd actually say that act will, uh, will be there and can be negotiated f from the point of view of reducing the, the acreage limit. Yeah, that came out quite strongly in, uh, in uh, discussions over this winter. Because in the act came together, Angus McLean was the premier and a very close friend of mine, and he was in many ways one of the driving forces of this. And there was a legislative committee that he set up, the Agricultural Committee, and it brought in recommendations, 18, the House accepted them, and I was responsible for making sure that it got into a statute and drafted with the help of the legislative draftsman, because it should say I was helping him. But it's an ordinary statute. It can be amended at any time. Um, however, you say that, and there have been a lot of amendments, and the only way to ensure something isn't able of being amended easily is to put in the Constitution. We don't have a Prince of Island Constitution, so a Canadian Constitution, so that's very, very complicated um, in order to, to do something like that. And um, I would... I guess just make the observation that um, what some people are asking for comes awfully close to a guarantee that something will not be able to be done in the future. And if we were to have a costume party when this was all over, I think I would come dressed as Moses with two tablets under either arm or one under either arm. And that's not who I am. Um, and I'm trying to examine this statute 30 years after an event to make some thoughts and observations and recommendations. Then it's up to another body, namely the cabinet, what to do. And um, one of the things that I've really strived for in these meetings is for all of these people to hear other people, to hear different points of view, to listen to um, people who are so articulate and who never intended to speak when the meeting started and conveys their ideas and suggestions because, quite frankly, folks, the people who hold different points of view on the Lands Protection Act in Prince Edward Island are not our foes. They are our fellow citizens who have different points of view. And what concerns me, and I'm not going to take the time right now to do it, is I'm concerned about the world wealth that exists out there of volumes of wealth and if people ever decide to use that to acquire Prince of Island lands, uh, we will be looking for our friends and community neighbors to work and help each other. I'm not trying to fear monger anybody. I just would love to see, and I think I'm failing, I'd love to see an increased level of understanding from people who hold different points of view of someone else's point of view on the Lands Protection Act. But you folks have done a terrific job. Um, the last time we were in Charlottetown, we started off with Mary Reed, the, the uh, Lucy Mom Montgomery Trust, and then we had Jane Ledwell and her friends uh, sing, and uh, it was really impressive. And I want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given us all tonight to come. Thank you. Now, Leo Broderick is standing up because I think he wants to come to the front. Come right up there, Leo. Uh, Leo Chevery is with me, uh, Mr. Carver. I'm sorry, who do you have with you? Leo Chevery. Oh, yes. Member of the Council of Canadians. Yes. So may I begin? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Leo Broderick, and uh, this is Leo Chevery, and we are members of the Council of Canadians. And uh, the Council of Canadians is a 
national organization of many thousands of people. And on Prince Edward Island, we have a few hundred. And um, we usually are involved in economic and social justice issues. And at the moment, are deeply involved in campaigns around water, trade, health care, energy and climate justice, and it is within the context of those concerns that um, we will be making our comments. We will submit to you later a formal brief, but um, what we want to say tonight is that we are deeply concerned about the state of land in, in this province. We believe that our water is being contaminated at an unprecedented rate through nitrates and pesticides. And even if we stopped industrial agriculture today, it would be 40 to 50 years before we rid our groundwater of nitrates and poisons. So it is somewhat alarming when we hear that there are those people in some organizations and some landowners who want to extend the limits of land ownership in the province. 3,000 acres for a corporation, in our view, is far too much. And in fact, uh, we will be recommending that that be reduced to the same as an individual. One of the big problems in this world regarding the production of food and the contamination of the planet is the impact of multinational corporations. I was in Northern Africa a week or so ago meeting with people over land and they identified a very critical issue which we were aware of before and which we were aware of in this country is that there is an unprecedented level of land grabbing in Africa, Asia, and we know that in Canada this is happening as well, and the National Farmers Union has documented that in 2010. By extending the limits of land ownership in this province to beyond 3,000 opens <coughs> us up to the possibility of land grab by multinational corporations and indeed countries that are buying up land for either food production on a monoculture basis or for other activity. So we're very concerned about that and we will be recommending at the very end that that 3,000 acres be removed to, to whatever we agree on for individual ownership. The context of our comments then will be that we want in this province a system of agriculture that is sustainable, a system of food production that is sustainable. And by every ounce of material that we have in terms of the research around the globe on industrial agriculture and the group previously has documented this as well, is unsustainable. In this province, we cannot continue with an industrial model of agriculture that primarily produces potatoes, which uses huge amounts of pesticides, three primarily, and plenty of chemicals. We cannot, that cannot continue. Uh, soil erosion, and the list of problems is as long as your arm. But the most important one to us is the protection of our groundwater and a system of food production that is safe and healthy. So that's a major, major issue for us. What we are going to be recommending is a sustainable system of agriculture that I think takes into, con into consideration the kinds of things that we would be associating with uh, organic or natural food production, where there is an emphasis on no 
pesticides, no chemical fertilizers, no use of fossil fuels. One of the issues that we also have is the whole question of climate change and the impact of climate change on Prince Edward Island with rising sea levels and the impact on the uh, ecology of the province. So we're going to be recommending that, uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, the limits on land ownership be reduced to 1,000 for the corporate interests, and it would remain the same for the time being for individual land ownership. That will be our uh, first recommendation. Our second recommendation is that we have a, <clears throat> a public doctrine which says that water must be treated as a public trust. Uh, we've already spoken to the government of the province about this before, but there has been no action. But clearly, if we declared that water is a public trust in this province, any action by any individual or corporation would have to be held under this, the lens of the impact on our groundwater. That groundwater must be made a public resource, and it is not up to individual landowners as to how they treat it and use it. We know that worldwide, water is becoming a huge issue. Access to clean drinking water there are one billion people around the world who do not have access to clean drinking water. We campaigned for water as a human right and the United Nations eventually passed it, even though the Canadian government abstained on that resolution. But we know that in this province, there are some people who do not have access to fresh, clean drinking water. Their water is contaminated and the list of people whose water is contaminated is growing. So that would be our second recommendation, that we have legislation and we would have really what would amount to uh, an act that would declare our groundwater as a public trust. And our third recommendation, and before uh, I ask Leo, uh, Leo would say a few words, is that we need, in the next 25 years, a transitional plan to move Prince Edward Island from an industrial model of agriculture to an organic or natural, and there is a host of words that can describe that. But we need a plan, and we need money that will allow farmers to go back into business or new farmers to go back into business. Agriculture worldwide is the biggest industry. And contrary to what most people believe or, or know, it is the small farmers around the world who feed and produce most of the food. We need a revitalization of our rural Prince Edward Island. And the only way that it's going to happen is that we reduce the size of our farms and return to small-based farming with many, many, many more farmers. If we increase the size beyond 3,000 of corporate ownership, we can say goodbye to the few farmers that we have left in this province. It's our history. It's the sacredness of the land that we need to protect, and so we're recommending that transitional plan. I often thought, you know, over the past two years, if government had taken the PNP money that came into the province and used it to clean up the province, it would have been wonderful. But we have to address that problem. It's staring us straight in the face. The island cannot continue on its course of a toxic system of food production, an industrial model 
I speak to some farmers and, and they would like to get out of that vicious rat race. And I think it can happen. And so that would be our third recommendation, a transitional model where we would, over a 25-year period, be able to say that we have, at the end of that 25 years, a system of agriculture that is in keeping with nature, that is in keeping with the issue of climate change, and that respects every being in the province. Thank you. And Leo? Um, thanks. Um, I just had just a few observations, maybe just to reinforce part of what was said, but also make some other points. And I know that you were very eloquent in terms of talking about Angus McLean and, and uh, bringing the act in and his spirit towards that and having known him and worked with him a very small bit of time, I, I would tend to agree that this was one of the legacies that he has given us and that people on PEI were, been, were very supportive at that time and throughout that time, very supportive and very proud of this act. So it's very surprising that, you know, that we actually are opening it up because in actual fact, I, I think very few people saw that there was actually a problem or difficulty with the act itself. But I do also want to tell a story because I think Angus McLean would like stories being told. <laughs> uh, what the, he, we all heard them, those of us who close friends, we heard them more than once, but what became more important in the story, the joke, was how he enjoyed telling them so much. Yes. <laughs> and and, and it's, my wife would suggest it's a habit I've acquired. Right. But, but I'm, uh, I guess I'm an, I'm an owner of some, of some land uh, within my family that's been passed down. But I know I've heard the story. My grandfather uh, was a small-scale farmer. He lived for 100 years. But he told me this story because it was a farm that his father had bought, and his father was a blacksmith who had never farmed. So he, being the youngest son, was the one who stayed on the farm and actually built up the farm. And he described me in detail in terms of when he went to the land, it was very unproductive because whoever had farmed before that had actually taken all the good out of the soil. And in actual fact, he told about the process of trying to learn from other farmers and bring in muscle mud and painstakingly building it up and knowing the land, the slope of it, how to build it up so that there was no longer any erosion. He built it up to a farm that supported him you know, for all his life. And he continued to actually you know, cut wood and recut wood uh, to make some soil and lived on that land and, and raised a family on it. And I'm very, and, but it was all about knowing the land, knowing what was in it. And since that time, we know a lot more about that process. And I think even scientifically, I recommend one thing that you should look at, because I think we're talking about something that we should look at not necessarily within an economic lens. I think we need to look at it in an ecological lens if we're going to look at this for a long period of time. And as a matter of fact, I know there was, I, some people I know within agriculture were teaching a course recently, a few months ago, and they had wanted to rent, they, they didn't have access to this documentary called Dirt. So I actually was able to go out, get the documentary for them at That's Entertainment and bring it to them to show it to people, some, some people who are doing some uh, ag education in the agriculture field. And I watched it myself later on, and it actually deals with the earth or the dirt being a, very much a living organism with a number of microbes and fungi and everything else that's in the soil, it's actually truly incredible to know that a handful of dirt contains all it does that's a living thing. And I know when talking to my grandfather or his contemporaries growing up in, in rural PEI, they were very concerned about the, of agriculture shifting away from knowing that to something that actually was tearing down hedgerows and building larger fields and larger equipment, but in actual fact losing the, actually the living component of that soil and replacing it with chemicals or other things in order to grow things. And I think we've seen that happen and we've seen the folly of that in the long run. And so I think we need to really be very clear that we really need to find, to work with the land, not against it, and actually know that the science that we know now is that the type of uh, applying chemicals just to keep things going or not really taking into account the uh, erosion and other things, that we really do, we're entering a very new era in terms of climate, we're in, in terms of climate change, which can be very extreme. It's droughts throughout the whole part of southern US last year, there's huge amounts of droughts, but also more extreme weather events in terms of rain events. And we've seen that happen on PEI in terms of what we've seen in terms of soil erosion and fish kills because of the more extreme weather events that are happening. That's due to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that model and that approach, we need to be really careful because the, because all the scientific evidence is showing we're going more and more in that direction. The, the extremity, extremes are going to happen. So the decisions we make today have to keep that in mind. And I also know, too, in terms of the industrial farm model, that small-scale farms do produce more food. Uh, mixed farms do create more biodiversity. Soil health is stronger. 
So I think we really need to really make decisions based on those types of things. We know the Land Protection Act, whether you say it's just opened for the first time in 30 years, regulations were changed recently, so in fact the definition of land was broadened so the actual fact it's already expanded. We've already gone the opposite direction away from what was passed 30 years ago. And also food sovereignty is really important. I think that in terms of meeting our needs, I know there's a whole new generation of people I know who are, whether market gardening or who are feeling calling to agriculture as a, a calling, who want to produce food, and find ways of making sure we can support those new people doing things in an organic basis or small-scale stuff to produce food, a wide variety of food is something that we need to really, that is our future as well. I also think too, as, as well as the Lands Protection Act, we really need to be looking at going further so we should have a Water Protection Act, we should have a Soil Protection Act, we should have other acts that incorporate the whole ecosystem that we have and look at it in that regard. And I know that recently some one group was talking about lesser, board, lesser buffer zones in terms of next to streams because of, because of the uh, woods or forests that are there, and there was very little uh, sympathy and actually a strong reaction against that along all the people who were there to protect uh, waterways and uh, the public trust in terms of ensuring that we, that those waterways and those things actually help protect our drinking water and help protect uh, our, our water. So I think really those are things we need to look at. And some other big picture things, because I'm also involved with some international NGOs. I'm a member of Oxfam. I'm also a member of uh, Atlantic Council for National Cooperation and other groups. And the land grabs that people are talking about, globally, it's very frightening that many countries or other large corporate entities are buying up huge tracts of land, whether it be in Africa or Asia, for basically for commercial purposes and to gain control over the food supply. That's happening, it's huge, it's documented. I would suggest that if you wanna look at it more, we might send you some more details. But that land grab is happening, and that's something we should be all be very concerned about, because that will concentrate the power of growing food or the power of accessing food in fewer and fewer hands, and we're not immune to that here as well. And also, we should also be aware of the fact that the lack of biodiversity in terms of uh, whether it be seeds or whether it be in terms of other types that we're producing, that we actually really need to make sure that biodiversity is something that we really need to maintain and, and have. And there's other things like trade deals out there that are threatening. We, right now we have some mixed farms, particularly those that maybe in terms of supply management. I know people who have dairy farms and grow other things who have a mixed farm. That's under threat as well in terms of trade deals that are on the table right now and being discussed. So we really need to look at this in the context of the economic reality and the thrust of trade deals to concentrate power and power in fewer hands. I think we really need to look at that as something that we need to protect ourselves from. And also think as well that in terms of the ecological decisions and limits to growth that we have, that we have to look at ensuring that the type of model that we need to go in is one that looks 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road in terms of where we need to get to in conjunction with the limitations we have in terms of climate change, but also limitations in terms of fossil fuels, and say, where do we need to get to? I think we can, we can actually protect our land in many ways. I think we need to look at it not just in terms of land, but for example, in Germany, uh, they have an energy system there where many farms uh, do produce their own energy and power on the farms. They have solar power and the other things, and the feed-in tariff actually allows them to not only farm profitably, but also we're able to make money from actually using their land to create more energy that support them on the farm. So I think the energy decisions we make in this province may in fact help support smaller scale farms or have farmers become more self-sufficient. And I know, for example, one case, I know Jimmy Gorman was trying to actually develop more windmills on his property and he was constrained because of the fact that you could only have, hook it up to one building. Whereas in Germany, if you look at their energy, farmers themselves on their barns or on their properties, they can attach solar panels or attach other things which actually will make them money in the long run and also help produce the energy for their farm itself. And I think we need to look at this not just in this context, the context is if you want to have a vibrant rural economy then we need to really look at the concentration of power and wealth in fewer hands because I think the concentration of power and wealth in terms of uh, Fortis or Maritime Electric in terms of how it operates now and even when you do sell energy to them it goes back to zero once a year. That in actual fact, that hurts farmers and hurts the farmers for themselves to be able to, to do new things to counter climate change and to actually make a living for themselves that we can actually use all of our land base to actually uh, help all of us. So I think we need to have some new innovative thoughts in terms of what we need to do and new policies. And I also know too that if you move towards uh, certain types of scale of agriculture, if we've, 
if you have a very capital intensive where you're only buying larger and larger equipment or you're more and more in debt in terms of what you need to buy in order to, to type farm and that type of thing, you actually will have more vibrant rural communities that actually have a more of a labor intensive model where you can actually have more people hired, they actually, the, the price you'll get for the food can be more secure and people can, there are more of those jobs remain in the local economy and actually you can consume and have food sovereignty where you live. And I think that kind of model in the long run will help us. Uh, and, and so I think we really need to look at this in a very broad context, but I think underpinning all of this, we will only, I think Wendell Berry or someone talked about, where, uh, in, in terms of the soil, if we don't maintain it and protect it uh, and have the models that are able to enhance that, then in actual fact, we're going to be actually just selling our, sell, selling our future because right now in the world, we look at not only fossil fuels, if you look at phosphates, if you look at a whole number of things, they're coming in more and more limited supply. There's actually, I just read an article about phosphates that there's only a very limited supply and they're, and they're limiting. So the model of agriculture based on those type of things are necessarily, will have to change. So we might get ahead of the curve and find out ways to say, where do we need to get to? How do we get there? And I think in that case, we'll have a more stronger and vibrant rural economy and actually create more jobs and have a healthier economy as well. So I just wanted to make those points. Thank you. And you indicate you're going to be making them yes. um, more. We'd like to receive that, and I would like a, perhaps you to spend a little bit of time in that presentation, the written one to follow. Leo, you talk about the need to have a transitional plan from going from here to someplace else down the 25 years and down the road. And I would be interested, not now, but in that document of explaining how we as individual citizens can do things and not just have our government do it. Because one of the most fascinating discussions I think we've had was out at North Rustico when we talked about what we can do. When do we open up our wallet to do certain things? Because as I said in North Rustico, if we want government to do everything for us, to quote my dear late friend, we must give to that government the power and authority first of all, to be able to take everything from us before it can return it to us. Uh, you make an interesting uh, case for Water Protection Act. I am uh, not dealing with that in the sense that there is um, as a Lands Protection Act, but uh, the thought has crossed my mind more than once. Uh, but I know the reason why. It was of the times and so forth and so on. And uh, if I said something earlier that left the impression that this was the first review of this statute in 30 years, then I misspoke. What I said, what I thought I said was it had been challenged in the courts once. And that that challenge, one could argue, was successful. On the other hand, any time that the Court of Appeal in this province speaks, it spoke a certain way, and it said that if you had lands that were leased in, you had to count them, and if you leased them out, you can deduct them. And it gave very good, reasonable, logical reasons for that. Uh, because of other pressures, uh, later on, the government of the day said no. Uh, when you lease in, you have to count, and when you lease it out, you're not allowed to deduct. And I, I might say a lot of people in these um, that I talk to find that logic a little hard to understand. And you know, one of the things we have to be very careful about in this legislation is we need to make sure that we don't do things and take positions that take away from the respect and the position the Lands Protection Act has. Because if that happens, then people will find various legal ways to do certain things and we uh, then start to have a piece of legislation that doesn't have the respect it has. And I think on the whole, for 30 years, it hasn't done too bad. There had been, over that period of time, significant changes made to the legislation. And it's not the same bill that started out in many regards. The, yes, the 1003 and so forth, but there are other significant changes that have happened. And um, I f feel pretty delighted that there's only been one court case. I'm, you know what my day job is, but I can tell you that I am more inf influenced by my political background, that 
when we have to resolve disputes in the courts. You might as well just have an old rock and roll machine here and put a few quarters in and shake and rattle and roll. And I want to tell you, some of the results that come out ain't what you think you're going to get. And I just think it's been fortunate only once. I uh, let you go in a second, but when you said that you mentioned uh, Angus McLean and you started to talk about dirt, I said in his stories, I said, here he goes. And I thought you were going to quote what he said so often to his caucus, which was, and he felt that when he became leader of the caucus, uh, there are only five conservative members, and yet within a year and a half, as he said, he had a royal gun salute of 21 and formed a government. He said he had to train the caucus a little bit, and the first, one of the first things he had to do was tell them when it came to dirt, the more you threw, the less ground you had. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, I might do something differently than I said I was going to do before. And we've had two groups up here speak, and I'm just sort of wondering, would there be one or two individuals here that have been just sitting here and just like to say something that mightn't be as documented here in the sense of paper and so forth, to just get a little bit of what I'd call a breaker here in between our going to the NFU and the Federation. Anybody in the audience would like to stand up where you are and make a couple of comments? Uh, and Ms. Parker, I see you back there in the back row trying to sneak in. You have a couple of comments you'd like to stand and say? Well, that's why I was in the back line. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Not in my office, but I did try and hire her. We had talked here, this honorable group here, about uh, reducing the land holdings from 3,000 to 1,000. Now, anybody who's ever been in the market knows that the more you dump on the market, the price goes down. So how would we uh, get that down to the 1,000 with the current landowners? Or would we grandfather them and wait until it came back to Islanders? How would we do that? Well, it was, it was a suggestion, Della, Della Parker, uh, the owner of Parker Realty. A little bit of a plug for you, Della. <laughs> but uh, it was simply a suggestion. It wasn't a suggestion I've heard before. And uh, I'm not saying that I would go there. But if you did do something like that, you can't just snap your fingers and be able to do something like that. You'd have to grandfather it in. My first reaction when I heard that suggestion was, if you take a corporation which has now three, the right for 3,000 uh, acres, that has to be three equal shareholders, and you want to take that down to 1,000, the simple way around that is that you just have one individual own the corporation, the other individual have a new corporation, and so forth. Um, but uh, I know that that perhaps wasn't what's suggested, suggested, but your point is, is, is an interesting one, and you can't just unilaterally do a roll clock back uh, without uh, having some protection or, or so forth. Uh, um, the suggestion I was tossing out, if you weren't involved in agriculture and so forth, that's a little different twist to it all. Uh, Della, uh, since you're on your feet, um, you, were you here early enough to see the, the clips on non-rest and ownership? Yes. Okay. And you and I have been in that business long enough to have seen various trends. Um, what type of trends are you seeing now with non-resident owners? Are they wanting to acquire more or are they wanting to liquidate? Or what type of trends are you seeing out there? last couple of years since the United States changed, especially with the 50 cents on the dollar, they came in in droves and they bought. They had access to money, right? Equity lines, whatever. Since that <coughs> dried up, you've seen substantial 100, you know, 360, whatever you want to say, 183 turnaround where they're divesting of land now. Because a lot of people came in, it's like anything, you come into the island, you take one look, you fall in love. 
if the love lasts as long as they get a piece of land and then they leave and they never come back or do anything with it. In some ways, that can be deemed very good because they're stewards of the land. They don't do anything. They don't develop it, you know. The trees are still there. The dandelions are growing up amongst the trees. <coughs> and you can say it's really more in a natural state. But since they lost access to the money, they definitely are trying to get rid of it. And a lot of those properties, they paid much more in the 90s and the 80s you know, then they, it's ever worth now. Because our vacant land, we have tremendous uh, inventory of it, and uh, lots, and wood lots, and that kind of thing. And they go, they're going almost like a lot of the pricing when they bought it, but of course they can't get that back. So a lot of it sits there <coughs> vacant and, and really not being bought. So, so the, the vacant land that is being sold by non-residents, you're talking primarily Americans, is that be, are those acreages being bought by islanders or other non-rest, other Canadians? Uh, being bought, we have a big trend right now west to east because land values were so great across, especially moving from Vancouver through to Ontario, Alberta, there was a lot of money around. So it's, that money translates very well here because we are known as cheaper land. You know, we're, you know, we're sort of on the lower end of the spectrum of affordable land. Here in PEI, whether it's a cottage with a lot, whether it's a waterfront lot or a piece of woods or, you know, farmland that somebody wants to get. We're seeing farms picking up the sale of them. Uh, those would be from the Dutch mainly, but central Ontario, where they're selling farms for big prices and they can come here and they can buy for cash very quickly. Uh, <coughs> dairy operations, beef not so much, uh, grain so much favorite is dairy farms. So you're seeing a lot of trends picking up with farmland. Nobody would touch it for a number of years, right? You know, banks wouldn't lend on it. Now you see farms uh, and farmland making a comeback. And it's, uh, a lot of it is islanders. They can't afford it. Okay. Um, these um, individuals that come from way, say Dutch buying farms, and um, other uh, non-residents, uh, invariably they are dealing with the Island Regulatory Appeals Commission and so forth. Uh, one of my terms of reference uh, really, although it's not stated, does have to do with that and red tape and so forth. Any quick snappers or thoughts about that whole area? Well, when they come in with the Island Regulatory Appeals Commission, uh, they generally like that somebody's going to buy it and actually use it. So, because you have to give like, you know, or you change a use and this kind of thing. So, if a dairy farmer comes in off island and they have a history of having dairy farms, obviously you don't want the milk, you know, the quotas, they're after quotas, but they're well-run operations. They want mechanized farms. They don't want any of the mom and pop farms anymore. So that's where you see those just going out of production. They'll sell their quota. The land becomes a lot of times rented perhaps locally or to somebody who's already beside them, um, and they just sort of die as a, as a family firm. I came here from Nova Scotia in 1980. When I came into the community of North Wiltshire, we had a hall, we had a church, we had, uh, I'd say, probably between eight and 10 dairy farms, we had beef production, a small amount of pop. There's one dairy farm in North Wiltshire now. There's one in Hampshire. Um, and then as you go along to Hunter River and come back. So that landscape has totally changed. And that was because two things, well, in my mind. One, because they just died off. And, you know, they sold their quota and then died and the farm just was broken up. Nobody's there to take out to them. And it wasn't, it wasn't viable anymore. They weren't being paid for the price that they had to get a combine up and running, you know. It just was, and they were two small farms, a 50-acre farm. They were all along, all through Darlington, Wiltshire, Hampshire. Now what are they? You know, a lot of them are just sitting there. And uh, because a lot of times you have a farm in between, a, say, a burger farm in Hampshire, there's land intervening, so they can't even expand the ones that are there. And it's crucial they, they have a, number, you know, a certain number of land for their quota. Thanks for coming to sit in the back row, Della. <laughs> Somebody else want to, before we go back to some former present, anybody else would like to say something right now?
or rather J.P. Hendrickson. I haven't seen you in some time. Good to see you. would take 40 years to disappear. Well, I'm afraid of the nitrate levels. We've had it here for a number of years, and it didn't only come from the fertilizers here. For example, we live in one this watershed and PEI on top of the hill. We measure the nitrate levels, and it's equivalent to where we had the hog farm at that time. So the nitrate levels didn't come here from the nitrate that was applied to the soil, because in that particular top of the hill, it was only potatoes twice in the last 35 years. Having said that, you can move east of there to Keeves Lake that has no inlets and no outlets. The mercury level is that high in that lake that kids are not allowed to swim or drink the water or eat the fish out of that lake, yet it has no inlets and outlets. So we have all those contaminants that are coming up the eastern seaboard of the United States and it's helped to contaminate our water, our resources, as well as our land. But it wasn't always like that, JP, was it? Well, I, this water, we checked the water 10 years ago. It was like that. And it was only potatoes at that time, one year in that particular field, right on top of the watershed. That's the longest watershed in PEI. From there, it goes north, uh, <coughs> the watershed, and it's probably one of the best watersheds we have in PEI today. It's not polluted, there's nothing wrong with it. But we come to the Hillsborough River, and what do we see in terms of water pollution? We're talking about it. The native people had said years ago any obstruction, Above high tide in a, in, a, in a river that has a tide moving in will totally sink in. A prime example of that, you look at the Hillsborough River today, and on the windy day, if you will drive up the Hillsborough River, there's no potatoes on either side of the river, all the way from Mount Shore, Ridge to Town, and it just runs red with mud, simply because we built a causeway across the river. You go all around the river, and you can see that same example. Government has done that to rivers, and we can't only blame the farmers for everything that's happened. You know, we have to look at what government done, and we as residents allow it to happen. Thanks, JP. If there's nobody else on this side of the room wants to do something right now, I look at the group, and I know you're not overly shy, and we'll probably hear from you before the evening's over. So we'll hear from the National Farmers Union at this time, please. That's right. And like this is one. How does this work out for you? I don't know. I like lemon better. You're holding that. Well, one of the, the same member of the choir in the back row this time. <laughs> Has he got a new hymn book now? Yeah. <laughs> well, the tunes are the same. The tunes are the same. Well, I won't talk about tunes. I can't carry them in the bucket, but anyway. Well, good evening, Mr. Good Carver, evening, Edith. And everyone else as well. First off, I'd like to introduce our group. On my immediate left is Randall Affleck, who is our NFU National Board Member and Regional Coordinator. And behind him on the left is District Director Elwyn Wyand and Reg Phelan, who is a member of the NFU International Program Committee. So we'll start our presentation. For some period of time. That's right. And I've read it on various occasions. And uh, I want to thank you. And um, so, and I think it's fair to say, and I don't mean this in uh, any manner, but I think the National Farmers Union and the Federation of Agriculture, I have given more leeway to the opportunity to speak at various <coughs> events than probably anybody else. And so, in my opinion, it is necessary to, for me, to read this word for word. I'd like you to highlight and address it. And uh, you've heard some comments of Mary's meetings, even since this was written and delivered to me, that may be helpful and you wish to respond to. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, hoping that uh, we could... Uh, uh, but, but if you decide to read it, that's fine. There's no problem. I'm hoping that uh, we could have your presentation perhaps concluded within uh, 20 to 30 minutes. I'm going to put the same comment on the Federation as well, and if that's sufficient time. And uh, I'm going to be speaking to your group on Thursday. It's not meant to be restrictive. It's just that I'm trying to, uh, you know, provide an opportunity for all to, to speak. Right. 
Well, we did take that into consideration. Sure. And with due respect to your thoughts, we decided that we should read the That's first fine. nine pages of yeah, our no presentation. Problem. No problem. Because we think it's very important for other people to, and, and to hear that. And you know, that. I, having so. said what I just said the moment ago, I said if she comes back and tells me it's here, important for whether I hear what she's saying, that's just going to quote me about an hour and a half ago, and away you go, Edith. Okay, we'll zip right along. The National Farmers Union appreciates this opportunity to present again our position on the Lands Protection Act. Thank you, Mr. Carver, for accepting the position as commissioner. You were involved in the formulation of the act, which passed in 1982. In the years leading up to that, the National Farmers Union played a central role engaging the wider community in urging the development of lands protection legislation. At that time, island farmland was under threat from corporate expansion. The government of the day, and especially Premier Angus McLean, had the wisdom and courage to proceed with the history-making Progressive Act. The PEI Lands Protection Act is the envy of many people in other jurisdictions. We agree with those who are insisting on this review of the Lands Protection Act that many things have changed since 1982. From the point of view of the NFU, the changes are indicating in very forceful ways that a strong and enforceable Lands Protection Act is even more necessary 30 years later. The corporate sector voice and power is now much louder and more dominant. The voice and power of the people gets easily drowned out. The number of farmers who are still free to promote and practice family farming has been reduced. Farm families have been squeezed out by corporate-minded control and takeovers. It is important to point out that during the past 30 years, the National Farmers Union has continued to develop progressive land policies which respond to the changing times. We say today with deeper conviction than ever the first statement of our land policy, and this is it. The members of the generation which is in power must not treat the earth as something given by their parents, but rather as something borrowed from their children. We must continue to insist that farmland is destined for producing healthy food in a truly sustainable way. We find more and more that islanders, other Canadians, and even some governments want to eat food that is produced close to home in an environmentally sound way. Unfortunately, only a smaller number will take stands to make sure that primary producers receive cost of production from their food production. We are more convinced than ever that farmland is a non-renewable natural resource that must be protected, not a commodity to be exploited. Since our founding as a national organization in 1969, we have declared that farmland is not meant to be bought and sold in the marketplace. The NFU wants to make it clear that it does not frame the issue in terms of small versus big. We make the case, though, that bigger is better is not the only business model to examine. We insist that success in agriculture can also be achieved by smaller scale farming. In PEI, with our long history of potato production, for example, we see that larger family operations are part of the agricultural scene. They can, with care and respect, exist side by side with smaller mixed farms, dairy, livestock, and vegetable production. The challenge is to balance the interests of both so that neither one nor the other is seen as the only way to go. One does not have to exclude the other. <coughs> Regardless of size, it is essential to see and treat the land as the basic source of all agricultural production and a basic source of life. It is crucial that farmers and all residents understand that the land on the island is limited both in amount and in its capacity. Our soil is delicate, fragile, and is in jeopardy of depletion from being pushed beyond its natural production limits. Massive doses of chemicals very quickly kill the soil, and it takes years to detoxify soil and rebuild the soil so that it can regain its original organic capacity protection of land for the public good. The protection of land is not only an issue for farmers. We have a number of events over the past 10 years which should bring home the point that the land in itself has a high importance in many different ways for the whole community. Dead fish in our rivers have reminded residents how our water and watersheds are directly affected by land use. The general population is becoming aware that we have only one source of water, and that is in the groundwater under our feet, and it is fragile. 
we have become aware that climate change is threatening the land of the island, not just on our shores, but inland as well. Many more people are insisting on thoughtful planning so that communities can have the safe, quiet space which the land provides them. The outrage of the continuous opposition to Plan B is a new moment in island land history. It has solidified the concept of the public good. Opposition to Plan B took into consideration many aspects of land as a common good from the perspective of ancient cultures, ancient growth, clean rivers, farmland, beauty of the landscape, the future of children, the power of the people to give the land a voice, and democratic processes. Nowhere is the protection and nurturing of the land more obviously a public good than in the need to preserve farmland and the need to keep that farmland in diversified food production. Many islanders have a vibrant cultural memory of past land struggles during the era of absentee landlords. However, a high percentage of the population is separated from the land. It is necessary to revive our connections to the land and to convince communities that it is in the public interest to maintain a regulated land tenure so as to transfer land to young farmers. It is not in the public interest to allow the continuing consolidation of holdings. We are losing the productivity of our island land. Some of it is exhausted from intensive monoculture, which requires massive doses of chemicals and the use of aggressive cultivation with heavy equipment. Some of the land is so devoid of organic matter that it is weakened and especially vulnerable to wind and water erosion. Family farm and industrial model. The National Farmers Union identifies two economic models which are apparent in Canadian agriculture, the family farm model and the industrial model. They are distinct, although not always mutually exclusive in their structure, goals and practices, and in their relationship to the land. The two models exist in a spectrum. Some industrial st style farms may in fact be farm family owned and operated while some family farms may adopt many characteristics and mindsets of the industrial model. In fact, historically, some self-defined family farms intentionally identify with and vigorously defend the industrial model, even when it is clearly against, the, against their own best interests. However, nothing will improve for farm families in Canada as long as there is a denial that the basic interests of the industrial sector and the farm family sector are direct opposites, even antagonistic, <coughs> and that there is a policy-based imbalance of power between the two sectors. The family farm model. The National Farmers Union is a strong supporter of the family farm. Our policy statement defines a family farm as, quote, an operation that produces food or other agricultural products and where the vast majority of labor, capital, and management are provided by family members, unquote. This, of course, implies the family controls production decisions. We know that family farms are the real generators of wealth in the food system. In fact, on a global level, farm families are the major food producers. The NFU has data which shows that family-based production produces at least 70% of the world's food, and we've heard that before this evening. Yet in the high-flying world of big money and big deals, the family farm is treated simply as a minor player, disposable even, and merely the producer of raw product used in a gigantic profitable network. In this world, the land also is considered as disposable. In the food system, it is only the farmers lacking power and legislative protection who have to accept the price they are given. This is usually below their cost of production. The other levels in the system have the protection and power to ensure that they take their profit. Farm families carry enormous debts and earn very low net income. In 2010, farm debt in PEI was $716 million, up from $583.4 million in 2006, an increase of 23%. Meanwhile, total net farm income was $15.7 million, down from $40.4 million in 2006, a decrease of 61%. The family farm model, despite being hammered on all sides, has a number of capacities which are critical to sustainable food production. These capacities are often invisible or denied. They are A, to ensure the intergenerational transfer of farming operations, 
B, to protect the public interest by maintaining a level of local control of food systems. C, to provide production and distribution processes which protect and preserve the environment. The intergenerational transfer of farming operations. The National Farmers Union feels that while the family farm system has the potential to safeguard the future of this form of production, the policy structure to support intergenerational transfer does not exist. Farm families and their organizations must hold governments responsible for enacting public policies to provide farmers the option of passing farm operations on to younger generations. Some of these policies are basic and far-reaching, for example, policies which support cost of production, farm gate prices, and all methods to increase the net income of farmers. While these more complex directions are being developed, other policies should be adopted to make intergenerational transfer possible. These policies should be designed to support older farmers in their retirement and to provide the younger generation with financial support and knowledge to get established. Protection of the public interest. Here in PEI and across the country, the National Farmers Union is pleased that more people are waking up to the need to have local control of food <laughs> systems and of the land. They know that the protection of the family farm model is not just a farmer issue, it is a citizen resident issue. It is more than ever a question of the public interest. It is an issue for everyone. Communities are coming to grips with the realities of food being shipped in from every corner of the world with minimal traceability for nutrition, health and safety. In PEI, a visit to the major grocery chains after the bridge is closed for three days is a shock for many. People are beginning to wonder what would happen in the case of a disaster. But we are hearing something deeper than fear of food contamination and shortage. The words food and sovereignty are now commonly heard in the same phrase. It is more than the question, can we feed ourselves? It is a concern about control and about social justice. It is clear to many that the sectors which control the food system control the lives of citizens. Now people are speaking of food sovereignty as a basic element of democracy. Protection and preservation of the environment. The NFU challenges its own members and other farm families, which are not yet members, to stand up and be counted as environmentalists who will do all in their power to practice farm methods which protect the waterways, the air, and all land. We need to be proud that our way of farming is respectful of the elements, safe and most efficient. The industrial agriculture model. The formulation of a national policy for Canadian agriculture, circa 1969, has been guided by conventional corporate economists and other key players in the corporate sector with a eye to maximizing their profits. In the present day, all policies endorse the capitalization of the food system and give priority and control to the transnational corporations, the chemical and machinery suppliers, transportation companies, banks, processors, wholesalers, retailers, produce dealers, and exporters. In past and current Canadian agricultural policies, the demands and needs of those corporations are promoted and protected, making it possible for this sector to demand their ever-increasing profit rates and to further enhance their accumulation of capital. <laughs> Industrial agriculture has not only the ear of governments, but it also can claim a privileged position with the media, much of which actually belongs to the corporate sector. We therefore find that the myth of efficiency of industrial model agriculture is accepted by the public, including some family farmers. One NFU member commented about some potato growers eager to be like the corporations, and he said, if they are so efficient, why do they have to keep expanding, even though they are going deeper and deeper into debt? In preparation for this submission, our members recall the early 1980s when it was so clear to us and thankfully to the government of the day that legislation to protect the land was urgent. The central questions now are, what were the conditions in those years that prompted us to lobby for the Lands Protection Act? Have those conditions improved? If not, why is anyone proposing to weaken restrictions on the ownership of land? It was clear in the 19, early 1980s that the corporate doctrine was leading in one direction, more and more power and control in fewer hands. Vertical integration was the order of the day. 
Large corporate, corporations were taking over many of the operations which made up their production schemes and the resulting accumulation of profits. However, what we saw then was mild compared to what we experience today. We never expected, of course, that transnational corporations could reach a point of satisfaction with respect to profits. However, not many imagined the level of corporate control of the food system that we have in 2013. The difference is not merely quantitative. We see it as an overwhelming shift of control, which involves a total reorganization of the food system, system and an unimaginable concentration of power over every aspect of the system. The almost total corporatization of food, subsidized by taxpayers' dollars, is a major threat, not only to food producers, but to all people for whom food is a basic necessity. A recent happening at XL Foods, a huge meat processing plant, indicated not only the inevitability of disease outbreak, but brought to light the level of consolidation and the inappropriateness of it. This one plant in Brooks, Alberta, processes one-third of all Canadian beef. In fact, only two companies process 86% of beef in Canada. Two corporations process 62% of the pork. It is clear to any thinking citizen that decreasing numbers of players in any aspect of the food system is unsafe and inefficient. When farmers go to sell grains, they are faced with the reality that 75% of grain handling is controlled by six firms. In PEI, where a high percentage of the potato crop is now dedicated to the processing sector, farmers have almost no choice about where they sell, nor much control over the implementation of contracts. Several years ago, one of the large potato processors in this province chose not to renew contracts with some smaller potato producers. Instead, they appear to want only a few very large potato operations with which to negotiate contracts. <coughs> Just before you uh, go into that too much, but are, are there many members of the National Farmers Union who um, have potato contracts and sell their potatoes to, for processing? Uh, there are some. I don't know the number, though. Um, like would we... Do you know, uh, Abe? So, when it comes to members of the National Farmer Union, like what percent? Like I'm just trying to get information, and then you guys have been at the meetings, and you know that my questions generally are to seek information, not to indicate comments one way or the other. But of the Federation, I'm sorry, of the uh, Farmers Union membership. Like, what percentage of your members would grow potatoes, or...? You gotta see the back row. But, like, I'm, I'm just trying to get, get gain here, Randall, what, what... How active the farmers' union people, farmers, would be in the production of potatoes in the province? Well, you're asking for a statistic that, I don't, that we don't keep, so I, I don't I know. Um, I, in terms of processing contracts, I, I, we know, I know that the, we, we have some that are processing contracts, <coughs> and uh, the, in potato production, uh, you know, just table stock, um, and, and what that change has been over the years, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, if you happen to find that out in the next short period of time, maybe you'd let me know. Edith. Well, I was just going to say that the National Farmers Union is not broken up according to commodities. We're an organization that oh, sure. represents all commodities, no, so we don't have that. statistics on how many no, potatoes. And, and, you know, I understand that. It's just that, that there were some comments made here about potatoes in the brief. I just thought it was an opportune time to, to ask a question. And here's somebody coming before. Your name, sir? I have to leave. Uh, You're going to leave? I have to leave, Mr. Carver. I know you'll be sad. But uh, I have well, to go because my wife is my wife is home. She's not 100 percent. So no disrespect, Ronald, and the rest of the National Farmers Union percenters. So okay. keep on you know, talking. Urban, keep on I've, talking. Listen, I've listened to you on various occasions over the years, and I must say that when this entire process is over, when I think of you, I'm going to think of what you said in Kensington, which is that your mind should be like a parachute. It only functions when it's open. That's right. That's right. 
All right. Nice, Thank nice, you very much. You nice seeing you again. And I hope this, Mrs. Lachlan is feeling better. This will be a great opportunity to make history in a sustainable mm. way. Thank uh, you. You've reminded me of that before. Good night. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Randall, go ahead. Um, the story goes on as uh, we consider that only a handful of companies control food trade, transportation, and retail. Farmers in the whole community certainly uh, have very little voice in the sale and trade of food products, but just as alarming is the level of control of the transnational corporations have uh, over inputs. Agribusiness and investment corporations are financing a large percentage of farmers, seeds, chemicals, and fertilizer purchases. It is quite common for a company which finances inputs uh, to require contracts which bind farmers uh, to deliver product to them. A cursory examination of uh, far-reaching control of a single company, Monsanto, uh, protected by uh, public policy, is a cause for alarm. Debt is a major sign of the loss of control of land, farms, production decisions, and food systems which farmers and non-farmers experience. The following is the... Uh, the change in ratio of dollars earned uh, to debt over the decades. In the 1970s, for every dollar farm families earned, the debt was $3.40. In the 1980s, for every dollar earned, the debt was $7.42. In the 1990s, the debt was $10.47, and from 2000 to 2009, the debt was $23.29 per dollar earned. The current Canadian farm debt is $64 billion. More or less, the amount of taxpayer monies uh, going into subsidies paid to farmers is equal to the interest paid on the debt. The, uh, in the coming years, if interest rates increase by 3.5%, it will mean uh, totally erasing all realized net farm income. When presenting this picture to existing po public policymakers and their corporate-minded allies, the NFU is constantly affronted uh, by the conclusions they draw. They seem to have the attitude that the corporate industrial model is the logical economic way of the future. They seem to think that the family farm has outlived its usefulness or viability, with their economics of scale blinkers on. <clears throat> they believe that the only unfettered growth of a corporate food system is the answer to the world's food problems. They ignore the data on, how, on the low efficiency of corporate farming, Canada's current industrial model uh, food system is energy inefficient and it is climate destabilizing. It is, a signif it is significant that the PEI government's own 2009 Commission on the Future of Agriculture and Agri-Food in PEI stated that by the 1990s, firms had grown in size to industrial scale and the industry. Characterized uh, by a trend toward fewer but more specialized farms, and a concentration of processing and retail, declining economic viability and environmental degradation. This wave is unsustainable. PEI farmers have found themselves unable to prosper by uh, competing in these globalized, uh, efficient, efficiency-driven commodity markets. The National Farmers Union has done extensive research on the nature, goals, and operations of industrial sector agriculture. Our conclusion is that under this model, the land is at com uh, constant risk. Rock-solid and forcible legislation, uh, restrictions, legislative restrictions on land ownership, and the use of only, uh, is the only hope for the protection of farmland in, uh, for the future. The Lands Protection Act under threat, PEI land under stress. Since, this, since the passing of the Prince Edward Island Lands Protection Act in 1982, there have been a number of court cases, challenges, and applications for exemptions. Many of these originated with one corporation, uh, the Irvings, Cavendish Farms. The indication that the Lands Protection Act has been an irritant for this major uh, player in the agri-food industry in PEI. Since the act was passed, successive governments have mandated various uh, studies on the land, a roundtable, a task force, and commissions. None thus far have heard recommendations to change the limits on uh, aggregate land holdings, 1,000 acres for individuals, 3,000 acres for farming corporations. As late as December 2009, Justice Ralph Thompson issued a report uh, of the Commission on the Land and Local Governance stating that the current limits on land holdings should be maintained. He indicated that in all the presentations he had received, only one recommended that the allowable holdings be increased. That was Cavendish Farms. 
It is important to note that the current government of PEI uh, formed the Commission on the Land Protection Act, uh, responding to pressures from two groups uh, closely connected to Cavendish Farms. Even though Justice uh, Thompson's recommended uh, maintaining the limits, he opened the door for a major increase uh, in holdings by proposing a regulation uh, regarding incorporating environmentally sensitive class of land. The NFU welcomes uh, the spirit of the resulting regulation change, which honors and prote the protection of sensitive lands. Moreover, the NFU insists that the environmentally sensitive lands are not inferior lands, but are essentially ecosystems which uh, support food producing land. The regulation allowed, uh, allowed the designated uh, non arable lands to be exempt from the 1,000 and 3,000 acre limits. The loophole seems to uh, be such a welcome relief that while the ink was still wet on the Thompson report, uh, regulation was put in place to consider only arable land uh, as making up the legislated aggregate uh, land holding limits. And we have an appendix uh, with, with that um, a change in the document here, but I will not read that. Uh, this regulation uh, resulted in uh, an average of about one-third increase in holdings. The, uh, the means, uh, that means that the new limits now are approximately uh, 1,300 to 1,400 acres for individual and 4,000 acres for uh, farming corporation. This is totally unacceptable to the National Farmers Union that uh, proponents of relaxing the Lands Protection Act are uh, complaining about uh, the accountability required to safeguard the acreage limits. It seems frivolous and unworthy uh, for any farmer to protect, uh, to protest the disclosure clause whereby individuals and corporations are obliged to uh, report in their acreage when their, if their acreage reaches 75% or more of the, uh, of the limits. The so-called red tape required a requirement uh, to report on land leasing, purchases, etc., is the best way for Iraq to keep track of what is going on in this area. Farmers are constantly being faced with many regulations, most of which are not nearly as important as the requirement to report on land holdings. If the land is important to farmers, surely we will find the time to make yearly reports, if required. More important than uh, an act under threat is the land in PEI is under severe stress from intensive farming. The land uh, must be protected by law, which is both restrictive and enforceable. With new technology, the excessive use of chemicals and increasingly uh, large machinery, much of our land is uh, deteriorating. Uh, soil is eroding at an alarming rate. There is a trend in the concentration of land ownership into larger production units, especially on potato farms, which are under uh, constant pressure from processors. We are witnessing a breakdown of rural communities. Farmers should be on the alert. However, Land ownership and land use is a concern for many people in PEI, uh, both farmers and non-farmers. Hopefully many other island residents will join the National Farmers Union in strongly opposing any move to amend the Lands Protection Act by increasing uh, the land holding limits in this province. Uh, the land grab threat. It is common knowledge that uh, there is a major uh, land grab movement uh, all around the world, including in other parts of Canada. Massive investment uh, funds are dedicated to buying up farmland for future use when it is predicted uh, the food prices will go through the roof. The Canadian uh, land grab story is uh, outlined in a June 2010 NFU report uh, titled uh, Losing Our Grip, How the Corporate Farmland Buy-Up, Rising Farm Debt, Agribusiness and Financing of Inputs Threaten Family Farms and Food Sovereignty. The study highlights the goals of a number of investment firms involved in uh, farmland um, acquisition uh, for their clients. Uh, some samples are uh, of advertising. Uh, and Bonifield uh, Financial enable institutions such as pension funds and high net worth individuals to invest in and hold farmland for long-term capital appreciation and income. In reviewing um, how provinces are preparing, are prepared for the land grab movement, PEI is outstanding because of its legislation. The NFU document states, the struggle uh, to stop corporations from buying farmland has uh, been most visible and most active in Prince Edward Island. 
PEI's Lands Protection Act serves as an illustration of how proper public policy can uh, keep land out of the hands of corporations and investors, but the Act and the uh, struggle over food land in the province also shows that uh, the limitations and challenges all jurisdictions face when trying to restrain the financial power of corporations. One aspect of this land rush is the is that investors prefer the convenience of having uh, land already consolidated in large parcels. It will be difficult enough for PEI to fend off the threat of uh, land grab attack. If the Lands Protection Act is uh, weakened by tinkering with the limits, the province is increasing uh, the vulnerability of the land in the face of uh, greedy investors who honour no borders. Uh, vision for the future. The National Farmers Union is uplifted by its membership across Canada which is showing uh, greater capacity than ever uh, to opt for smaller acreages uh, and for mixed farming. They are growing in their capacity uh, to integrate new methods of caring for the land on which livestock plays an important uh, role in maintaining their organic matter. In PEI, we also have a, number of, a good number of farms who ha are diversifying and requiring fewer acres to produce good quality food. We need assertive action to make this uh, blossom into a fully viable uh, uh, sector. T uh, together we can discover our own advantages. For example, even though there has been alarming consolidation of the lands in the hands of a few, we may be able to identify uh, many land holdings uh, have been uh, preserved from monocultural production. We, can, we recognize that farmers are an aging population. The average age of PEI farmers is about 54 years. To take the positive attitude, that means that we have many good farmers with uh, many years of knowledge and experience to share. We have to grow uh, a growing population of new and innovative uh, farmers, not growing fast enough though, uh, of course. But this is an area that needs planning and support. The NFU will continue to push for deliberate public policies to help young and beginning farmers uh, get started in responsible farming, giving them access to land and other resources plus appropriate training. The NFU is concerned about the uncertainty of farmers uh, who have uh, spent their li uh, lives in food production and don't know how they're going, uh, they can retire. This brings us to uh, the ongoing theme uh, farmers have to make a livable income from their production. In other words, they must receive cost of production. Long-term negative income cannot be overcome by a year or two of reasonable prices. We continue to lobby for uh, public farm policies which ensure incomes uh, while farmers are producing and uh, provides uh, sufficient savings for retirement. When farmers are forced to look uh, to the sale of land as the only way to retire with dignity, uh, they are cheated a second time. While uh, we are hoping for a change in the structure of agriculture, uh, there are some options. For example, greater investment in land banking and land trusts. Land zoning uh, would also uh, would go a long way in keeping food producing land in uh, care of farmers. As well, we would urge governments to establish um, a well-run trustworthy agency like the Land Use Commission uh, to purchase and hold land uh, for future farmers. Perhaps I'll let you do the uh, recommendation. We're almost finished our recommendations. That the National Farmers Union urges the Carver Commission on the Lands Protection Act to make the following recommendations to the government of Prince Edward Island. That the government of Prince Edward Island enact progressive public policy to ensure cost of production for island family farmers that the government of Prince Edward Island close permanently the Lands Protection Act with regards to any further increase of the Act's aggregate land holding limits or any form of manipulation of those limits, that the government of Prince Edward Island develop and implement a plan for identifying and salvaging land which has not yet become engaged in monoculture, either as owned or leased, that the government of Prince Edward Island develop and implement a system, policies and programs to allow farmers to retire without having to sell their land to corporate interests, and that the government of Prince Edward Island develop and implement a system of support for young and beginning farmers who opt to engage in mixed farming. It's all respectfully submitted by the National Farmers Union, and I might say it was put together 
by our membership at the grassroots level here in PEI. We started back last November 24th and worked over the winter to come up with this document. And if anyone wants a copy, I do have some extras, and if we run out, I'll take your name. We'll be glad to send you one. Would anyone just like to raise their hand? Would you like a copy of the National Farmers Union report? Just raise your hand. <clears throat> okay, right up here we have Carol Carriger from Cumberland. You haven't spoken yet. Mitch McDonald. Mitch McDonald. And then there were a couple other hands back there. Bill Trainer. Peter Foxley. I'm from Foxley River, but Peter Bulger. Okay. <clears throat> Greg, do you want to grab a couple of copies and pass them out? And uh, if there's anybody else, anybody else over here want a copy? Okay, who do we have back there sitting? Okay, right behind uh, Carol here in the white, red sweater. You would like a copy? No, you have a question? Go ask your question then, please. Would you like to ask a question? Well, I remember back in 1982, um, which was a few years after I came to live in Prince Edward Island, that I was instructed by my political masters at that time to draft the Lands Protection Act. Now, I appreciate that it has been a very imperfect instrument, but it has served reasonably well to ensure that there is at the political level, a conscious regard for the interests of the farming communities of Prince Edward Island. I commend Mr. Carver for taking upon himself this very arduous and difficult task of attempting 30 years later to recommend appropriate changes. But I would wish to remind everyone that I admire his courage and I do not envy his task, but he himself cannot suspend the laws of economics. <clears throat> he is, I'm sure, very familiar with all of the challenges of uh, climate change, water, all of the elements which have been touched upon here this evening. He is very conscious, I'm sure, of all of these, as we all are, as a matter of public knowledge. But I, I think I should point out to the meeting that very few of these challenges can be met by creating legislation. Legislation does not solve or resolve most of the economic and other problems that are faced by humanity. It is a very blunt instrument and the generalities uh, are not uh, particular assistance. Uh, in my view, the, 
there are two very distinct elements in dealing with the Lands Protection Act. One is about purchasing PEI land by tourists and uh, people of, uh, of uh, generous means who wish to live in a place which is beautiful and tranquil. And we saw from the introductory uh, film that there are immense tracts that have been purchased by people from the United States and elsewhere <coughs> who choose to come and live in these communities, at least in the summertime, and contribute to them and uh, learn to love the beauty and tranquility of this island. But legislation of itself cannot resolve the issues of land being made available to non-residents. I think that in many respects, the policy should be to encourage people to continue to come to live in this province simply because of its tranquility and simply because of its beauty for to have people who will retire here or come back here. That is one side of this whole aspect. The other side of it is agriculture. And agriculture the expectations at this meeting I find unrealistic because Mr. Carver cannot suspend the laws of economics. He is not canute and can stand and prevent the tide from coming in. Uh, so I wish, I wish him well in his endeavors. But I think it is helpful or most helpful to him if rather than addressing and making recommendations in generalities that they be very highly specific recommendations. And with that, I think uh, I, I thank you, Horace, for taking this on, and I thought I should make those comments. Thank you very much. Um, I have wondered about my level of courage, and sometimes as well, having agreed this task. Um, for the group, could you be so kind as to give us your name and address? Uh, my name is Raymond Moore, and I live in uh, Dorchester Street in Charlotte. Raymond Moore is a very distinguished solicitor who comes from Northern Ireland, who went to Bermuda, legislative draftsman, came to Prince Edward Island, and it was my unbelievable good fortune to be the legislative draftsman for the Prince Edward Island Lands Protection Act. I went away one time at the Constitutional Conference and found out that somebody out west or up north was trying to lure him away and uh, I just simply put a call to executive council and I said make sure that this item is on cabinet's agenda for next week. And uh, we've been successful in retaining him here since then except with a little sojourn to Bermuda. And as you may have gathered, although you haven't heard from him in the legal community for some time, on occasion he will be found on the stage of the Confederation Center of the Arts. And uh, he is the person who deserves the credit for the drafts of the Lands Protection Act. And he kept saying to me as we were doing the work, he said, why did you give me such little time to do this? I said, because it's only recently the Premier told me I was the Cabinet Minister doing it. Anyway, it's wonderful to see you here, Ray. Absolutely wonderful. Priceless individual. And... Um, do I see somebody over here? Ray, uh, Randall? I'd like to respond to Mr. Well, sure. Moore's comments. Yeah. Because they're really good comments. And, uh, and, and for sure, we know you can't defy the uh, rules of economics. 
But the point I'd like to make that's not in our, in our brief, and I haven't raised it with you earlier, is uh, like we, we need to, we have to analyze the, my, my concern in the, in the whole process in terms of uh, uh, make, uh, changes to the Lands Protection Act is that we're treating a secondary uh, disease. You know, we're not dealing with the primary cause. And I realize that uh, Mr. Carver and the government of Prince Edward Island can't uh, deal with the primary cause in, uh, in farm incomes. But, the but we have to recognize, in my view, the role that capitalization in land and, and in, to a lesser extent in equipment. But the, the, you know, what that has, uh, the impact that the capitalization has on, on um, the cost of production uh, at the farm gate. Now, the pu public policy response from government um, right across the country, and it, it's largely led by uh, agriculture, you know, it's promoted by agriculture economists. We all understand it, the efficiencies of scale. Uh, you know, so the, the, the goal, and I, I think they're quite sincere, is, is to uh, uh, increase farm profitability, and they recognize that uh, a bigger, uh, you know, economics of scale is the solution. And, uh, but, at the same time, we, we're not recognizing the flip side of land ownership and how uh, returns are, are recapitalized into inflated values on land. So um, uh, Dell Parker made a very interesting presentation here earlier, comments, and about the price of uh, you know, land devaluation. From, from, my, from the National Farmers Union's point of view, <coughs> if your goal is to transfer land uh, you know, from, from your family to the next generation, whether they're your family or, or younger, younger farmers, the devaluation of land is, is, is actually quite desirable. It's not desirable from a farmer that wants to retire and doesn't have enough savings. But, you know, for the protection of land, it, it is very much the case. And if you, you know, and so when you open up the, the land, you, you've asked the question about uh, in, investors non-farm investors uh, at every meeting. And, and clearly, the, in, in our view, the, the, um, the only people that should uh, be able to purchase agricultural land is, is farmers. And, um, you know, and that, when you put the investor in, uh, that competition uh, inflates the price. And then when younger, you know, it puts that asset or that, uh, that land uh, f further away from a, um, a younger producer getting in. And it also, it, it has the impact on the other side of, of raising the cost of production. And uh, so uh, the point I'm trying to make is that we're only looking at one side of, uh, of the issue from a government right. policy point of view. You take the position that only farmers should be able to own agricultural land. That means that if a farmer wants to sell the land, that his, the people he sells to can only be farmers. And if they can't pay what he can get from somebody else, then you're saying to your colleague in the agricultural community, um, your asset that you invest in, you took care of, and you didn't subdivide over the years and everything else, is worth less. Well, it gets even worse. <laughs> because now we, because of the, the, the level of on-farm debt, you know that's secured by land. So if you devaluate the land, then you you know you you know you're you're a wreck economic havoc on on. The, but so I mean, I I appreciate that there's there's not uh, a list of five priorities that will immediately uh, create results. But you mean you know we're we've got the tail of a, a real nasty dragon in agriculture and food production around the world here, and the sooner we recognize that. And, and try and, and deal with it to, you know, to try and get that under control, the better off we are. And I, I guess that's our, my, the point that we're trying to make. One of the things that I, as you can see, my throat's starting to leave me, but I try to do various things in these hearings. But one of the things I tried early on to do is to have people have different points of view and express them. And I'm sort of coming to the opinion that when my report is written that on that score, I probably will have not succeeded. And therefore, maybe one of the things that I need to recommend is some type of a vehicle or mechanism that will provide for ongoing dialogue and discussion. 
And, um, you know, what are our core values? Uh, like, as a lawyer over the years, Raymond knows that everyone thinks we're supposed to go off to court. Well, when I was a young buck out of law school, I sued the mayor and I sued the city of Charlottetown and go ride the course of just out. The older I got, I thought my obligation was to keep my clients out of court. And then I decided to look at the Code of Professional Conduct and found out that that was my number one obligation, is to keep my clients out of court. But it just seems to me that one of the things I've tried to do with difficult cases and I look at people on the other side is that let's get together and talk about the case. Let's have discussion where we can, never mind the lawyer's letters going back and forth, let's just sit down and have a session where we can understand and talk and everything else. And maybe there aren't some things we can agree upon. I had a court case a few years ago and it got to the point where it looked as if we could possibly settle. I think there were five lawyers and there was one sticking point one sticking point, it had to do with my client and another client. There were five lawyers. And um, we're in front of Chief Justice DeRoche, who was the chair of the Nitrate Commission. And uh, I said, my lord, I think you need to interview each of the five lawyers to see if there's any common ground. He says, I think that's a good suggestion. Mr. Carver, I'm interviewing you first. The waft was chambers and blah, blah, blah. He says, what do you think should be done? I said, there's one significant point here that nobody can agree upon. My clients will not agree upon it. And the other people won't agree. Why don't we agree in our terms of settlement that there will be no decision whatsoever about that issue? It had to do with land. It had to do with trees. We agreed upon everything else. Everything was resolved except that one issue. That's about 15 years ago, and people are still living beside each other, very friendly. But the issue is not legally this resolved. Okay? And so I'm sort of wondering if one of the things I shouldn't be recommending is some type of a type of an ongoing dialogue that maybe where some groups can sit down and hear each other. What are the common things we can agree upon, Randall? and then build upon and build upon. Somewhere along the line in all of this, people have to be educated as to the seriousness of the food industry and of how little farmers are getting. And it can't all be government do this and government do this and institute that program. You know, there are health commission hearings going on in the province right now and the education ones were before that. And I'd like to know somewhere along the line when we, where we as individual citizens are going to open up our wallet and be prepared to do certain things. And I think it can happen, but it has to happen with awful small steps. And uh, anyway, that's my spiel on that. You've heard it before. Um, I thought your presentation, you d did a fine job. You. Um, did it, Edith, in my calculation, with about 32 minutes, and it was pretty fine. Um, you're not, your group isn't the only one, but I think that I might feel obligated to say that the, Judge Thompson gets a little bit of a, rough, a bum ride by being saying that he was the one that recommended the government put in this regulation about environmentally lands. Actually, what he recommended was that all arable lands be, um, only arable lands be included in the Lands Protection Act. And the government didn't deal with that, and they put a regulation in it. So it wasn't really his. I know you have the um, regulation in Appendix 3, but uh, others have drawn the same conclusion. That, there is a misstep there, but um, I just feel an obligation to say that in Judge Thompson's behalf. And I um, want well, thank you, and I'm sure that I will see you or some members of your organization tomorrow, and perhaps even in Wellington. You're some of the most faithful attenders I have. And I want to thank you very much for coming. I don't think I got all the names, so if you're okay. happy, just come and let me know. Okay, one is Peter Bolger here from Fox the Yacht, Peter. Okay? Okay. All right, so I think the hour is going on. We're going to hear from the Federation of Agriculture right now. And Alvin Keenan, the president, and John Jamison is here.
Other people are here. Is that okay? Mr. President, Mr. Keenan, are you going to speak first, or Mr. Jamison? Actually, I'm going to go through a slide deck, uh, okay. and uh, we don't, we're not going to read a formal uh, presentation, but... Uh, we'll need your slide presentation either tonight or another occasion. What's that? Will you give us a copy of the slide presentation? Oh, yeah. you'll, uh, you'll have a copy of it. Uh, I'll, I've actually, I think I've emailed it already, and there will be a brief that will encompass this uh, uh, okay. with it. So uh, with myself is uh, Alvin Keenan, President of the Federation of Agriculture. He was newly appointed in January 2013. Uh, but we also have a number of members. I think most of our executive is here. Um, Why don't we stand up then? Mary Robinson, David Mall, Abe Buttermer, um, Grant. Bertha Campbell. Bertha, Bertha Campbell. Grant Compton's hiding back in California. And Grant Compton's on our board, as is Paul Gallant, if he's still here. And uh, I, think, okay. I think that's the, some of our board members that are here also. And um, so what we'll do is sort of go through a, a little bit of a backgrounder and then we have some actually some specific recommendations at the end. One of the things I'd like to say in opening is uh, we really appreciated your work on the, uh, on the act so far and we were glad that the government saw fit to do a re review. Uh, it was our organization that uh, along with the potato board that had asked for it. Uh, thinking that uh, you know, 30 years was a good time to, to, to review it. And, and it, and it has been looked at over the years. Um, I like your comments a few minutes ago about what I, well, I call them shared values. And I think there are a number of things that, that we can agree on. Um, our recommendations are, are uh, very specific to the Act, but, but there, there are other things like the, the, the vibrancy of small farms the, the uh, inclusion of young farmers into the industry, the environment that aren't necessarily included in the act. And I think we need to have a discussion on, on how we can get to a better place with those things. But our, sorry. I agree. And I've been trying out And I've got, to, how many more months do I have? Two and a half more months I'm trying to yeah. try and get some of these shared values agreed upon. And, and I think there was, there was stuff in all three presentations that I heard here, here tonight Oh, yes. that, we, that we could all agree on. Well, go back to my earlier comments, is that I think there's much more commonality in some of these points in this room than sometimes we think. Now I can figure out how to move this clicker. Okay. Uh, Evan, are you still here? <clears throat> Which one is the uh, forward button? Did Evan go? Oh, it oh, works better when it's turned on. Go the wrong way. Maybe turned off. And... Uh, here we go. Just a little background on our organization. We're uh, Prince Edward Island's largest farm organization. Uh, we were established in 1941, so we've just had our uh, 73rd AGM. We also are a member of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, and we are a member of the Atlantic Federations of Agriculture. So we, we. Uh, partner with, with organizations both nationally and regionally. We also are a member of a number of national uh, uh, boards that uh, our members sit on. Our membership is comprised of individual members, so individual farmers pay, our, pay dues to belong to our organization. But we also have 12 commodity organizations, such as the dairy farmers and the potato farmers and the organic group that, that uh, are members. And in fact, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had two groups that are that are forming, or one group that's forming, the Strawberry Growers of PEI, who will be joining the Federation. And we've been approached by the PEI Beekeepers Association to become a member. And our mission, like the other organizations we've heard from, is to improve the sustainability of island farmers and their families. 
And uh, besides our lobbying piece, we also support island farmers by providing uh, safety programs for farmers and their employees. Uh, the environmental farm plan has been delivered by the Federation since 1998, and we also deliver the advanced payment program. Sometimes I've heard comments that the Federation is all about big farms, and I just wanted to say that we support farms of all sizes. And in particular, we have policies that are dedicated to small, local, organic, and young farmers. And one of the things that we've done a number of years ago is we lobbied uh, the government to reduce the threshold on the bonafide farmer program. And this is basically what, what uh, how you define a farmer and allows him to, to participate in certain programs and allows him to have an uh, exemption on, on when we had PST on PST. And a couple of weeks ago when I was at the blueberry growers meeting in, in uh, Charlottetown, I spoke at it and after I spoke they get up and they talked at length about how they appreciated the Federation lobbying for this uh, several years ago. Um, I mentioned that we, we administer an advanced payment program. Under that program, farms can borrow up to $400 million, or $400,000. Uh, the first, the, the first. <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. What, first, what rate of interest, John? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the first 100000 is zero interest. No, 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 I was talking uh, about the $400 no, million. No, we, we're, not, we're not the PMP program. Uh, the first 100000 in that program is interest-free. And what we've done for small farmers is our, I met with our administrators this week, or this year, and we tried to figure out a way that we can encourage small farmers to participate in the program. So we've reduced significantly the fee for farms that are borrowing up to $25,000. Because capitalization, finding capital, is a, is a problem for small, for small farms. Now, from our end, we have to do as much work on a $25,000 loan as we do for a $400,000 loan. So it's, it's really a, the amount of paperwork is the same, but what it does, it helps, it helps again small farmers. Another thing that we've just uh, incorporated in the last couple of weeks, and we've had a big uptake on this, we've negotiated with Co-op Energy um, for a, six, a minimum six cents per liter discount on fuel. And again, for a large potato operation, they can go to a supplier and say, I'm going to buy thousands of liters of fuel, and they can negotiate a price. But for a tiny farm that doesn't have that ability, this minimum discount of six cents per liter is significant for them, and, and we've actually signed up a number of new members in the last week or so just because of this. Uh, we're a sponsor for Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers and for the Atlantic Young Farmers, so we support young farmers that way. And, um, Within our office, we also, you know, there's been some talk of organic here tonight. We provide office space for the organic growers co-op, and we, their, their spot is right next to mine within our office suite. They have access to, uh, to our office infrastructure, which, which uh, helps them. Another thing we've done for young farmers, we've established a permanent position on our executive committee. And that's not an ex officio, they're an equal member to all our executive. And at Pat, Pat Dumphy's our rep on that. He's not here tonight. But that's a, that's a permanent position, and we've also encouraged our member organizations to do that. Um, we're, we're continuing to lobby for the establishment of a land bank too, something like the old land development agency that, allow, that has allowed young farmers to enter the system and, and uh, a number of years ago, and we see value in that again. Do you have a specific model in regards to land bank too? Yeah, and then you'll get that in, in your written, written uh, you. submission. Um, another thing that we do, for the last six or seven years, we've put out a calendar, and we've produced several thousand of these. Uh, 90% of them go to non-farmers, and in that calendar is local farmers who are selling local product, mostly CSAs, people who sell at the farmer's market, and it's a wonderful way for them to promote what they're doing, how they do it, and where you can buy their product. We also have a Facebook page, and we're continuously promoting local, local farms on that. And in fact, 40% of the current PEIFA board is made up of either small farms, certified organic or young farmer. So when, at the end of our presentation, when, when I make our recommendations, I want people to remember that those recommendations were agreed to by the 12 organizations that we represent and the board, which is made up of individuals. And, and again, 40%, we have three young farmers, we have three certified organic farmers on that. 
We have small sheep farmers on our board. So our board, while it does represent, you know, some bigger operations, it certainly represents farms of all sizes. And we've pushed for the HST, and that benefits farms of all sizes. When we, we talked a lot, heard a lot tonight about uh, corporate farms and family farms, and, and again, we certainly support family farms. If you look at uh, the 2011 Census of Agriculture, when, when farmers had to identify how they, how they are structured, uh, if you look at the number of farms in Kings, Queens, and Prince, the numbers are there, a little over 200 in Kings, um, around 700 in Queens. And, and slightly over 400 prints. The second box is ones that are either an individual, they're family owned, they're a partnership that's either written or, or, um, uh, or family corporation. So that, that shows you that the majority of farms in PEI are still family owned operations. And of those, the small blocks are the non family owned. And of the small family owned, 10 of those are community pastures. Now, we've talked about farm numbers declining. This is the number of farms that, have, that we see by revenue class across Canada. And, and the blue line is the farms with under 100,000 in sales. And the, the other lines are, as you can see, from 100 to 250 and, and upwards. What we've seen across Canada is a significant decline in the small operations. And, you know, whether we like it or not, that is a reality that 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 we haven't haven't been able to stem. We, you know, see you see a, a significant decline in the small classes, a little bit more stability in some of the some of the larger uh, larger farms. PEI is no different. In uh, 1951, we had 10,000 farms in Prince Edward Island, and uh, today we have I think 1,411 according to the Census of Agriculture in, in 2011. So even though we've had a Lands Protection Act in place, we have seen the same amount of, of consolidation on Prince Edward Island that we've seen in, in other provinces. And um, so, you, you know, there was quite a bit of discussion here tonight that you don't want to see the limits raised because that, that impacts on small farms. The fact that we've had the Act since 1982 really hasn't slowed the, the, uh, the consolidation. Here's where we're at uh, today in terms of the disposition of PEI farms. Uh, the first block is farms that have gross sales of under $10,000. And again, your first, these, these go just the last four census of agriculture, 1996 to 2011. Again, the small farms we see decline right up to, uh, to the large, larger farms with gross sales of 250000 So again, that just shows through the revenue classes uh, some declines there. Now, I looked at 2010. There's a report called the Statistics on Revenue Expenses of Farms. And this is PEI numbers. And these are net operating income. For, for, and this is basically the bottom line for farms of various sizes on, uh, on Prince Edward Island. So farms with, and they didn't look at farms under 10,000. Um, for farms that, that averaged 10,000 to 50,000 in sales, they, that year they saw a minus 69.43. The next group saw a minus $52, basically broke even. And then you saw net operating expenses for uh, you know, in pretty decent numbers for the uh, for the other sizes, with the biggest being farms that have revenue of greater than five hundred thousand. Now, 2010 was a particularly good year in agriculture. Grain prices were reasonable. Potato prices were reasonable. There was even uh, uh, a slight increase in hog uh, sales that, or hog prices that year. So even even through a good year, it's very difficult for small farms to make to make a dollar. And again, this is just another, another slide that, that shows that uh, and BF stands for business focused. Again, non-family farms, these are your corporate farms. Now this is Canadian numbers, but again, it shows that the, uh, the, smaller, the smaller farms, the lifestyle farms, which are the, the smaller operations, the low income farms, and the pension farms, that refers to farms that are owned by people over 65 years of age. And again, that slide just shows uh, how difficult it is for, for some of the smaller operations. But even with consolidation, PEI farms were not huge corporate entities. Someone whispered to me here tonight that he was on a, 
He was on a trip recently in Texas, and he visited a farm, and I think he said it was 825,000 acres. We're not anywhere near that scale. So when you <coughs> see the, the numbers back here of greater than 250,000, in terms of real production, that's only selling 150 steers in a year. That's a 75 hog uh, farrow to finish operation, 35 dairy cows, 80 to 100 acres of potatoes. That's not, those aren't huge numbers by any stretch of the imagination. And the George Morris just, uh, Center, which is an agricultural think tank, just completed a study and they looked at the earnings after direct costs and, and Overall, the Canadian average was 22 percent. Canada PEI average is about 20 percent, and that meant that you know after everything, most everything was paid for. You had about 20 cents left over for to pay yourself, to pay your taxes, and those types of things. PEI is a little lower because of our distance from the markets, and uh, but the, you, you have to realize that that's an average over all farms in PEI. We've seen significant uh, returns for some of the mink operations, which bring those, bring those numbers up. In fact, in, in uh, Nova Scotia, uh, mink farming is the biggest income generator. And, and, and that's your supply managed uh, farms included in that too. So Alvin tells me those are pretty darn good numbers <laughs> for a potato operation, and they may, may not get there these days. So even with that 20 cents left in each dollar of sales, that means that farmers have 20 cents, they have to pay their taxes, they, we talk, heard about farm debt, they have to pay that interest on that borrowed money, they have to replace equipment, and they have to pay themselves. So if you have a small farm that only generates 50,000 in sales, that means you have $10,000 left. So that's where your off-farm income is really important in order to keep those, keep those operations viable. And generally, what you're looking at is about 250,000 in farm gate sales. That, that means a person can be a farmer and, and not have to look for work elsewhere. And, and we've seen gross revenue declining for all farm types and all farm sizes since 1990. And that's, you know, we heard about economies of scale, and that's what has driven this. Um, and, and what we're saying is that farms of all sizes require a basic infrastructure. If you're going to farm, you need certain amount of land, depending on, on the size of your farm. You're certainly going to need fertilizer, fuels, tractors, those types of things. And, you know, often they spread those costs over more acres. There is a significant regulatory burden for all farms now, regardless of, of uh, what farm you're, your size of farm. You have to report, you know, if you're a certain size to IRAC, you have to look after... Uh, you know, CRA, you have uh, food safety programs for almost every commodity that you have to hire, that you have, that you have on farm. And for example, if you uh, you know, have dairy, if you have beef and, and potatoes, you're filling out food safety programs for three commodities. As a small mixed farm, that's a really difficult thing, and you're paying for three separate audits to come on farm. And, and again, that makes it difficult. And, you know, if you look at the infrastructure, a 300-acre potato farm is very similar to an 800-acre potato farm. You have to have a certain amount of tillage equipment, tractors, uh, warehouses, those types of, those types of things. And, and, you know, the average is about $3,000 an acre to grow potatoes. So the, the risk is, is fairly significant for these farms. And, again, livestock farms have to deal with, with manure. They have to deal with environmental regulations, regardless of their size. And again, dairy farmers is different than when my grandfather was, was milking you know, 15, 15 cows. You have to have specialized equipment that is expensive, regardless of your, your, your size. And again, all these costs have raised since 1982, and, and farms have simply tried to spread these costs over additional acres. Rightly or wrongly, that's what's happened. And since 1980, Farm size in Canada has increased by 52% to, to capture new economies of scale. On Prince Edward Island, where we've had the Lands Protection Act, average farm size has increased 80% to an average of 398 acres in 2011. Now, the total area in farms has declined. So if you look at 
This is the numbers from 1961 to 2011. That's, that's the area in farms, and that, again, that's from the uh, Census of Agriculture. So the million acre farm, we were the million acre farm in the 60s, but since then, you know, right now it's about 594,000 acres in, in farms in, in 2011. So an increase in corporate land holdings doesn't necessarily mean an increase in farmed acres. And again, I've heard people say, well, they want to grow more potatoes. This is, an, this is a slide that shows potato production from 1981 to 2012. The peak was in 1999 when we had 113,000 acres of potatoes. We're down to about 87,000, I think, in 2012. And if you look at uh, recommendations from the United Potato Growers of Canada, they're recommending another reduction for 2013. So you're not going to see an increase in potato production. The, economy's just, the economy isn't there. You're seeing a, a reduction in consumption. There's uh, uh, a number of factors in play there. So, you know, we're, we're, but what is being said is we need to sort of figure out how we can match the acres with the number of farms that we have available to us. If we look at the role that agriculture has on the rural economy, we still are the biggest piece of the economy in Prince Edward Island with almost all of our farms located in rural PEI. And PEI agriculture has the second biggest impact on the provincial GDP in Canada, Saskatchewan has, plays, uh, has a bigger piece of the piece of the provincial GDP. Uh, in 2011, farmers on PEI spent over 40 million in wages to non-family members, and another 20 million in wages to families. Uh, and our direct employment was around 4,000. And the total operating expenses in 2011, the amount that farmers spent on machinery, on wages, on fuel, those types of things was 382 million, and almost all of that was spent in our rural communities of PEI. And it's more than just food on the table. You know, there's a multiplier effect that, uh, you know, when, when a farmer buys a piece of machinery from, uh, from Kensington, you know, they have mechanics, they have people in place who would turn and spend on the, on the economy. So there's a multiplier effect of, of four to five for that. But there is a structural change that we've seen that when I saw that when I showed you the numbers declining over the years. Technology has allowed more acres to be farmed by the same number of people. Um, I read a report today that looked at uh, the number, the amount of agricultural production in 1980 per person, and in 2012 that number increased by about 35 percent. So four people on a farm can manage a much larger farm today than they could in, in 1981 because of uh, technology. But the, again, these, these costs, the GPS uh, type things are expensive and they are spread over more acres. We have seen, and, and Della talked about it earlier, a lot of smaller, older farms have been current, purchased by current farms. And it's often at the request of people who are trying to retire. Um, I heard a number the other day from, from John Handrahan, who's the head of the, uh, um, the other land use commission, that there's, I think, 80,000 approved lots on Prince Edward Island that are just out there. And, you know, in, in many cases, I think farmers have had to turn to selling lots in order to, to, to meet their retirement, meet retirement needs. But in, in many cases, these uh, smaller, older farms have been, have been purchased at the request of other people. They haven't necessarily been taken out of business by, by the uh, uh, larger farms. And the other thing that, that we've seen a lot more of is requirements from the end purchaser for a much more consistent product. And again, that, that hurts smaller operations. So if you have, to, you know, if you're selling, I used to work with the hog board, and you had to meet a certain grid when you were sending those animals to market. Potato producers require certain specs. Uh, the cattle, I was at the cattleman's meeting the other night and they were talking about when you send an animal to the plant, that animal has to meet certain specs in order to, in order to, uh, to, to you know, to make the grade. And, and then again, we talk about the regulatory burden. It's especially difficult for small farms. I know Alvin has someone on his farm and that's basically all they do is deal with regulations and deal with food safety programs. Did you want to mention? Yeah, just uh, 
just so everybody knows I can speak. Uh, if we go back a little bit, John, uh, I'll turn it back. I, I just want to touch on a little, so we don't think that the potato industry is all over here. Which way am I going? Back, I'm going the wrong direction like I generally do. Just uh, in, the, in, in this slide, it shows, you know, that potatoes, uh, acreage should reduce this many, this many acres, and it has to do with the, uh, it has to do with the trim line yields of how, of the increase in yields across North America. And to understand a potato crop for a moment, it's, you know, it's almost a supply, uh, it's a supply and demand commodity, but in North America, potatoes can't come into to the, to that continent from any other continent in the world, really, because of quarantinable pest. So in the United States and Canada, all, all we have to do is be cautious not to overproduce to, to uh, maintain a reasonable return on our investment. Uh, as yields have increased in the United States, uh, they've increased, uh, to, uh, I think, uh, fi an average of 500 weight per acre annually. In Canada, it's about uh, 250 pounds the acre increase, but when you take the increase and the reduction in the fresh potato consumption, that's where those numbers come from. I just want to touch on a little, just an example, because if we go back, you know, in anybody's time in this room, there's people here that would, where they can go back 50 years quite easy in, in thought process. And at that time, there was 20 types of produce on a store shelf in California. And uh, uh, one of them were potatoes. Now, I'm not sure how they gathered their statistics then, because today, if we go into a, a you know, your Sobe or La Blah chain store, you'll find about 30 skews of potatoes before you, before you touch on organic. So that's all different packages and different sizes, but the total, the total number of skews in produce today, where in 50 years ago, or almost 60, it was 20, today it's pretty near 900. So consumers have a lot of choices. And so, you know, in the, in the families of crops in, in, in the world, I'm sure Prince Edward Island has some options on, on other crops to produce, you know, and so, uh, so they don't produce more potatoes than the marketplace will, will, uh, will, uh, will uh, absorb. But I, I just, uh, I, you know, I'm cautious to not leave something unturned that, so we understand the numbers, and I hope that's important. So. Yep. Yeah, and I also mentioned the the regulatory burden and that uh, the structural change in a lot in a lot of cases that it's it's difficult for small small operations to be profitable and 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 uh, work needs to be done on that. If you look at the changes to the Lands Protection Act since 1982. And I think, uh, again, our organization was supportive of the, of the act when it came in place in 1982. The holdings of 1,000 and 3,000 acres probably met the needs at the time. Um, however, there's been changes over the years that have really reduced the farmable acreage. The double counting in the 1990s reduced in, uh, you know, the in and out type of thing that, that would have reduced those numbers. Um, and while they were extremely necessary and still are, the environmental regulations also reduced the amount of acres. In 1982, those things weren't in place at the time. And those averages were about 25% on, on most farms. So when you take your woodlot out and, and those types of things, and then your, your, your holdings of 1,000 and 3,000 suddenly become you know, significantly, significantly less. Now, there was an increase uh, on the ability to exempt significantly, uh, environmentally significant land. And this was something that the Federation had asked for. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a really poor uptake, and I think there's only been about 10,000 acres across the island that, uh, that have taken up on that. So, you know, when we, the ability is there to, to exempt those lands, but it's, it's been a really poor uptake, and, and mostly because of the regulatory burden. I know, uh, Kevin Byer shared here several times that, that uh, Wyman's were able to, uh, to um, access this, but I also know that, that Kevin spent a lot of time 
with my staff going through maps and figures, and he's gone through, uh, uh, you know, they had the ability to basically put someone on that, and they worked at it for the winter before they got that exemption. Right now, most farms don't have that ability to have a hired person to, to do that. There's also a certain level of distrust among farmers, and you have to go through IRAC for that. And the application, again, is for the registered owner of the property. So if you're renting land from one of those non-resident landowners that we saw in earlier, they, they really don't care whether, you know, whether it's exempted or not. So that, so that, that whole process hasn't had the uptake that we, uh, we would have liked. So some of our recommendations, and these are specific, we'd like to see a reduction in the paperwork uh, burden under the Act. We'd like to eliminate the need to seek permission to rent or lease land. Right now, farmers have to do that. We'd like to eliminate the need for reporting under sections 8 and 11 and simply have individuals and corporations sign an affidavit that they are in compliance with the Act. We'd like to maintain the environmentally significant land exemption and perhaps simplify the process. We'd also allow, like to allow a small acreage to be set aside from a corporation's land holdings for the purpose of providing a shelter to the shareholders of the corporation. And we'd also like to maintain the current requirements that shareholders, that corporations required, are required to have three shareholders, three equal shareholders. Because right now, people think that as soon as you get incorporated, bang, you're at 3,000 acres. Well, that's not the case. You have to have three, three equal shareholders in order to get to that. And we, we'd like to see that provision stay in place. However, we have heard from several members over the last while that um, are, are an issue that they're close to their land limits, there's three equal shareholders, the mother and father want to retire, or someone dies or becomes incapacitated, we think there needs to be an orderly period there to transition to bring in another shareholder. Right now, if, if, if I was, uh, my brother and I had a farm, he passed away, I have to bring in a shareholder immediately under the act. There's no, there's no uh, grace given. There, you know, there's, IRAC will, I think, work with you, but there's really nothing under the Act that, that allows for that. We'd also like to maintain the current limits for non-resident individuals and corporations. So we don't see value in off-island corporations coming here to buy, buy farms. But we would like to see an increase in the land holding limits to 1,500 for resident individual and 4,500 for island corporation. And again, that is not to increase production on the island. It's simply to try to match the, the, uh, the land with the farms that are out there. And, and I think we would maintain the practice of double counting because we, when we, when we met, um, and in, in the brief I send you, uh, there is an appendix that talks about the steps that the Federation took to come to these, come to these uh, decisions. And again, ours were grassroots. We had people sitting around the table for several days at a time. And, uh, we saw that that probably should remain in place. And we also think that there needs to be a land development agency too as a mechanism that allows orderly succession of farms and allows young farmers to enter the uh, industry. Just, just so I understand, <clears throat> maybe I'll understand better with a cough drum. The Federation of Agriculture is tonight saying that it supports the current practice of double counting if you if you increase the the acres, oh, oh, it's an and. I didn't see the end there. I just saw a bullet on the oh, left. Okay, well, well, it's it, basically what they're saying is maintain the double county if there's if there's an increase. Okay, and if there was no increase, I think it'd have to be looked at. Okay, because um, people sort of use double counting like going to Tim's, double double, you know, and all that type of stuff. It, there's nothing prohibited from being triple counting. You know, Alvin Keenan owns 100 acres. He leases to you, and you lease to Patrick Carroll. Uh, I think, I think if I recall, and it was about a year ago that we had the discussion. I think there was some concern that there could be paper transfers. I think. It, oh no, that, that's that's always the issue. Yeah, it's always the issue um, about shams and and so forth. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And one of the things that I think that we 
that has come up in a lot of discussions lately is that there's there's a lot of loopholes in the act, uh, even as the way it is. And if if uh, a corporation, and I think you know, wanted to come in here and buy land and had and wanted to hire a really smart lawyer like Horace Carver or some some others, you could probably, you know. Well, get away with things. A corporation coming in here is going to have a very difficult time acquiring land, but individuals with proper planning over six to 18 months is not going to have very much difficulty if they have buckets of money. And then going back to the matter of successorship, how much time do you think would be a reasonable period of time to deal with uh, an estate, uh... I, I haven't I haven't discussed this with my board, so I'm only I'm only thinking of, and I tell everyone my uh, my opinion is the opinion of my board. Um, I would think probably six months to a year might be a, a feasible time that that someone. Can I tell you, you were entirely over, overly optimistic. Life is complicated. These days, death is even more so. Well, that's why they have a smart guy like you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Who understands, you know, estate planning and that type, those types of things. But uh, um, again, we have we haven't put a date, a time on on um, what would be uh, what would be an appropriate time. But I do I do hear from a number of members that are saying that that concerns them, that. Uh, they have two people, mom and dad want to retire. I can buy the farm, I have the resources, but you know, I, I can't because I'll be out of compliance and I have to bring in, I have to find two equal shareholders to do that. You know, I have another guy come in the other day and he said, I'm, you know, we're only farming 1,100 acres, but it's me and my dad, and dad's 80 and wants to retire. So I either got to get rid of 100 acres or find another shareholder. So it's, it, is an, it is an issue. We think the, the act should be periodically reviewed. And just in summary, a few closing thoughts. If we want a viable rural economy on PEI, that's dependent on agriculture, I think the act does need to be looked at. Uh, PEI is not immune to rationalization that's taking place in Canada, and it's in all industries, including agriculture. And all we have to do is, you know, I grew up east of Montague, down in Gasparo, and when I was, when I was a young fellow, 16, 17, there was four country stores within 10 kilometers, and they've all disappeared. And it's the same reason why, why some of our small farms have had a difficult time uh, managing. And an increase in allowable acreage is an attempt to match the number of farms with the farmed acreage on PEI. The current act is a heavy per paper burden, impedes growth, but it also puts small farms at risk because they, de they also have to deal with, with paperwork. Um, the act must re meet the reality of farming in the 21st century and meet the needs of farms and PEI going forward. Uh, the aging farm population is becoming an increasing issue in PEI with many operations with show shareholders wanting to retire. We are not seeing the demise of the family farm or the rise of the corporate farm on PEI. Our, many of our farms have incorporated, but uh, some cases there are you know, 35 head dairy farms. The need for agriculture has never been bigger, and by 2020, Canada could be one of the few countries in the world with the ability to feed itself. Farms of all sizes are needed, and the regulations within the Lands Protection Act have minimal impact on the success of small farms. The act has been there since 1982. We've, st we've still seen small farms disappear. This is where we need to have a discussion on how we can maintain those small farms and how we can bring new farmers into the, act, into the uh, province. And the other thing that, that a lot of times this discussion has been framed, it's almost a small farm versus big farm discussion, and it's not. And we're seeing a lot of cooperation, and a lot of times the small farms tend to rely on the larger farms. And we heard that from, from Danny McKinnon, I think Christine is here in Montague. Uh, the other day I had a farmer come into the office and he was actually joining the Federation for the first time. He said, I made $10,000 last year. And then he was showing me his properties that he had. He had his taxes with him. And he had, he had quite a bit of property. And he said, I'm able to keep that land because I rent to a potato farmer that's close by. And he said, that allows me to hang on to that land. And he said, not only that, this guy had a small beef herd. 
He breaks up my pasture when it needs to be, and he breaks up my hayland every now and again. So there is a relationship that, that small farms, and you know, it's, it's like when my granddad was, was farming in the 70s and he, he had a combine. Well, he did a lot of custom combining. It's, it's really no different today. A lot of the blueberry guys you know, work with Braggs and Wyman's in order to. So there, there's still a lot of cooperation in the industry, and it's not necessarily a small versus big farm. You know, and our, and our concept of big farm is completely different than, than what you get away from here. Uh, we think, we do think there needs to be a lot of work in terms of environmental stewardship. I sat on the action committee on, on fish kills this fall, and there was a number, along with, you know, Gary Linkletter and others, there's a lot of work that we need to do in environmental stewardship. I think it's, it's, it's separate from the Lands Protection Act, but it does need to be, need to be looked at. And my final slide is from a guy named Edward Denning. Change is mandatory, survival is optional. And again, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. You will get a copy of the deck along with our brief. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I hope it didn't take too much time. No, I, th I think you're fine. We all know that the Carvers were in Calgary for Easter, visiting three little grandkids, and one of whom, the middle guy, is absolutely, completely obsessed with dinosaurs. So we made a mandatory trip um, to Drumhiller, to the Dinosaur Museum, 90 miles away from Calgary. I was in the back seat, and after we eventually left the divided highways and all the whatevers, we are out into rural Alberta. And you know, it didn't feel like home. It didn't have a feeling that made me want to be there. And it just went on for miles and miles. Occasionally you would see a few buildings. I think once or twice went through a town. I don't know what was open in the town. And uh, occasionally some buildings had a house around it. And the biggest operation I saw was a Hutterite colony. And uh, of course, one of the biggest problems I have when I go to Alberta we go in the fall, I take bulbs and plant tulips for my daughter. Is just putting your fingers in that black dirt it doesn't feel clean. It's the red stuff that feels good. But I just said to myself, man alive. Rural living in Alberta sure is different than here. And farming is sure different as here. I'm not by any way advocating that that's a model. I'm just saying that. National meetings, and we talk to farmers in other provinces, and and they they you know they get a kick out of how small our our operations are, and they they wonder how we we manage to survive even the even the big operations. Over the years, the Federation of Agriculture has consistently taken the position that only arable lands should be used in the calculation of the Lands Protection Act. I didn't quite see that up on the screen tonight. Yeah, did I? I think it was there. Okay, then I missed it. Yeah, that so, we so that is that. The, still the position yeah. of the Federation. It is, and it is one of our, we had sort of come up with 10 recommendations on the act, and that is still one of them. Okay. Like I we, knew, we think I, we need, you need to simplify the process. The, the process to exempt that right now is flawed, but, uh, but we certainly support that and continue to. Okay. Well, what, do you, what do you think of... Um, the idea of zoning agricultural lands and Prince of Allen to be agricultural lands. I think that will probably be a discussion that we'll have to have with John Handrahan and his group when when they are they come up. I know that, you know, my recommendation to the my board will be that we'll have to look at it very strongly. But again, we ha we don't have an official position on it yeah. just yet. And I, but I, but I think when you when you frame that discussion around an individual purchasing a thousand acres of land, that becomes less of an issue if the land is zoned as, if the land is defined as agriculture. We we need to maintain, you know, if we want to maintain our agric our, our rural communities like I talked about, we need to maintain that agriculture base and that eighty thousand acre eighty thousand subdivision lots that are out there are a concern. And whenever a house is built in one of those lots, it has an impact 
on all the land around. It's the same as if someone was coming in and building a, a, a mink operation or something. Well, at some point in time, some government, and it has nothing to do with any particular party, is going to be confronted with that major decision. Um, you know, we've, we've allowed, uh, maybe off topic a little bit, but we've allowed development never happened all before over the in place on this island. And as a result, we have school buses traveling 15, 20 minutes to go down this road to get someone. We have, you know, and that, and that adds to it the costs of running this province that we are going to have to deal with at some point. We um, haven't talked tonight, and you're getting more questions because you serve at the latter part of the evening, but um, uh, it, the question was asked to me, and I threw it out to the audience in Montague about uh, crop rotation, and I have been quoting perpetually all over the province, both in your absence <laughs> and otherwise, that basically you said that it was your opinion that 75% of the farm... Actually, I, I had asked someone at the Department of Agriculture okay. what, what, how, if they felt that, because they do, they do yeah. monitor that, and that's what they had told me, that okay. they felt that 70 to 75%... All right, 75%. but we'll share the credit with them as well. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so the 75% of farmers are in compliance with crop rotation, and you've heard my story that that sounded pretty good that night, and the more I thought about it, I said, well, you know, it's not right in an exam. Uh, it's that 25% of the people in the agriculture community aren't in compliance. And then the more I thought about that, it didn't make me feel good. Yeah. And, and, that, and that hurts the people that are in compliance. Exactly. And so they have to compete against the people that aren't. Exactly. And, you know, I don't mind telling you, like, you guys may think that the only time I'm dealing with this at public meetings, but last Friday afternoon, I got home Thursday night, last Friday afternoon, spent hours getting briefed in great detail about soil erosion and sustainable, how much can leave and all that. This is a complicated situation. It is. And somewhere along the line, gentlemen, the agriculture community has to, I'm not criticizing you or you, you too, but the, the agricultural community out there needs to come to the recognition that we can't have 25% of the farmers in Prince Edward Island not doing adequate crop rotation and hurting the soil erosion in Prince It's just unacceptable. There, there's a lot more to protecting the soil, too, though, than just a crop rotation. And that's what a, I'm learning, a, a, a John. A poor rotation can be as harmful to the soil. A poor three-year ro three rotation yeah. could do as much damage. It's, there's a lot more to it. It, it is a complicated issue. It, it has. It has I, I don't mind telling you that if the one issue Maybe I'd be careful with the absolutes, but one of the major issues that has surprised me in this entire process has been crop rotation and how little I know about it and how important it is. And somewhere along the line, all of us in this business that we're in, agriculture, whatever, I'm not in it, but somehow we've got to solve that. And, and, it, and it probably takes you know, bigger minds than, than, than you and I here. No question but, about that. But I, but, I do, but I do hear from farmers that, that for every action, there's a reaction. And, yeah, and I sort of picked that so up over these meetings. They, they, uh, they'll say, okay, well, we, we tried minimum tillage, but then we had an issue with wireworms or something. So there's, there's, there's a lot of interconnections there that we have, to, we have to, I think everyone in the room will agree, we have to do a better job of stewardship. We can't, we can't see our, our land eroding. But, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not sure that's, that's a part of this discussion or whether it's another discussion, but it has to be held, for sure. Yeah, no question. You're thinking, Alvin? Well, just, like, on the outset when the, a year and a half ago at our annual general meeting when the motion came to the floor at the Federation of Agriculture to change the Land Protection Act as far as ownership, change it from, you know, from 3,000, like, to 4,500 for corporation and from 1,000 to 1,500 per individual. One of the things that I was so concerned about was I knew we needed change, but, I, but we had a fair amount of peace before that. And you know, and tonight you talked about that earlier. How, how, do, we, how do we come to a conclusion with everybody that's, I might say everybody that's in this room because it's important and everybody has a voice and everybody thinks what they say is the answer. And I and I concur with that. Like that's, and uh, we all understand things differently because we we all 
uh, things work different on different farms. I'll, I'll go to a wild explanation. In the, in the late 60s on our, on our farm, Don Anderson brought a gentleman in one day from Idaho, and his name was Jack Simplot. Mm -hmm. And as he visited the farm, he, we were packaging potatoes in jute bags. He, he wanted to know, could he sew a bag? And he did, and he fired on the handcart. And, and I mean, the, the history of that man, he's a French fry giant, and he's deceased now. But in a way, uh, uh, he said, uh, Ray asked him, what do you, my brother asked him, what do you think of Prince Edward Island? He said, it'd be okay if he owned it all. You know, and where he come from the West, that's exactly, that, that would be a very common answer. Because but, the, but the big difference is, and I didn't comment on, on Texas, where my brother lives in Houston and everything is big down there, but the 800 and some odd thousand acres in that farm in Texas and this guy out in Alberta, they're still not a province or a state, and we are. No, no, and I, I realize that, but my, my, I guess what I'm coming at in point in our thought process so we can all be happy, there's a lot of different ideas on how this should be, and that's why I went to the extreme of one person on, on it all to, to the number of farmers that we have today. Well, and I shouldn't say farmers, we shouldn't say landowners, the amount of land that's owned on Prince Edward Island and people, but back to, back to reality in our trade agreements and things, and this is what we all wrestle with in business today. As we, as we work to, we are an exporting province, and as we work to market our product around the world or, and, and around just between, you know, the eastern seaboard of the United States and as far west as, well, I'll just say, Ontario province, we constantly run up against large organizations that bring food in from all around the world, and it's getting to be a smaller place, and those are some of our challenges to stay competitive. I, whether I like it or not, I, 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 I sure have uh, uh, big concerns on how we can stay abreast of it. So that's, I mean, I mean sure. th that has a factor on how people, why people think different in different walks of life in agriculture here in Prince Edward Island. In our own farm, we produce the vicinity of a thousand acres of potatoes, and you know, I have to be careful of my language sometimes, but that's about the size of a piece of fly dropping on the map of the world in, in today's production. You know, like that's, and, and, it's, it's, and to market in the marketplace today, you're not a factor anymore with, with only that many potatoes. And, and that concerns me. Now, do I want more? That's not the answer what I want, but how do you, how do you stay in the marketplace today in, in, with the odds that we have against us? So that, that's some of the mix that we need, and I don't know how you put that together so you have contentment. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, on other occasions tonight, I've asked if people have a couple of questions, and the questions can be directed to me. Did I'd I? just like to make one comment on, sure. before we leave on, on the discussion on, on stewardship. And um, I think the comment was earlier that, that small farms always do a good job. I worked in the hog industry with the hog marketing board for a number of years. When I came to the Federation, I worked with the Environmental Farm Plan Program, and I didn't see any difference in stewardship between large farms and small farms. I saw some large farms that did a horrible job but I also saw some small farms that did an equally bad job. And, and I think back to uh, a tiny hog farm that I was involved in when I worked with the board, I went to, to visit to do a food safety audit. And this guy was only selling maybe one or two animals a week into the, uh, into the plant. And all of those animals were eating out of the same trough, a feeder, essentially. They were all fed starter feed, which had medication in it. He never got caught at the plant, only because he was only selling one or two. But to the average person looking at that farm would think this is a model of sustainability. And it was probably the, the scariest thing I had seen at the time. And I actually went out on a Saturday morning and built a wall for the guy myself. So it, 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 you know, there, it, it does, it's, it's the attitude of the farmer that, it, that means whether they project good stewardship or not, and not the size of the farm. Okay, so um, a couple of questions that people would like to direct to me for the Federation of Agriculture. Does anybody have a couple of questions like to direct? Um, well, I think, JP, since we heard from you before, we're gonna hear from a young woman behind you. Um, 
And your name? My name, I'm Karina Phillips. Yes. I'm from Fairview PEI, but I'm currently living on the Burns Road, um, east end of the island. And I just had a question. Um, so how, I was just wondering if the Federation um, had a limit of how big would be too big, like competing with um, like the market, like do you have a limit as like to how big you would go, like how big is too well, big? I think the limits we suggest were 1,500 and, and 4,500. And again, that's, that's three equal shareholders at 4,500. And in, in many cases that means, in a lot of cases that means three families are, are living off that, off that farm. So we, that's, that's the limit that we suggested, which right now it's 1,000 and, okay. and 3,000. And also, um, like, uh, like for the future, I know you, you're talking about getting money off for fuel, um, but uh, what about for sustainable power, like wind power, solar power? Um, is there any return for farmers? Actually, we've been, direction? and Peter Boswell is here, and I've been quite involved with him over the last several years in trying to promote renewable energy on farm. And we've, we've hosted mm -hmm. renewable energy uh, um, uh, seminars for farmers and a lot of the stuff that Leo was talking about Leo Chivery we you're, you're completely on board with so we've we've been and and uh, I've we've worked with our partners in Ontario who have had a feed and tariff program there we had we had asked for a similar so in another there. 30 years you aren't going to push the limits to be even bigger like no you I, have, I don't have like so this would be the maximum like as big as you would go sort of thing. well it is right now yeah yeah, but just yeah. competing with the global market, you're not going to keep pushing to go bigger and bigger because it's pretty hard to do that, being small. We're never <laughs> going to meet the global demand, I wouldn't think, the size of us. Jay, Jay, one question there was touched on, Mike, and that is we talk about your crop rotation. Is, is field size in terms of potato production? If you have a 100-acre pavement and only has a three or four degree slope and you have 200 meters from the stream, you're going to pollute that whole stream if you even following the three or if you crop that field in one year. We only we have a couple of fields like that, but we take three consecutive years to crop that hundred acre field, and it's only got a three degree slope, and we're further than 250 meters from the stream. And that it's so not only uh, farm size, it's field size is more <coughs> important to erosion and the pollution of streams than any than anywhere else but regular. One of the things that we looked at when I was a member of the Action Committee on Fish Kills was field size. And we, you know, the, one of the fields in particular that we looked at was 200, 200 acres. And we recommended that that be split up and that it was just too big, too, too big to manage at one, in one block. You mentioned about <coughs> farmers have to get bigger. Or, but anyway, I went the other way when I went and I was in hogs mainly. And we did retail a few pigs at the farmer's market when we were there for 16 years. And just going by Sobeys and Superstore prices, we were getting at around November and December for the last few years, $110, $125 for a pig. Retailing, same cuts. We didn't make any specialty cuts, but retail price, we were getting $550 for that pig. So there's money made in the system. Farmers not there, getting there is, but if everyone decided they were going to sell at the farmer's market, you yeah, wouldn't be able to. Yeah, but why isn't there a market system there, that's set most up? Most people want to shop at, at Sobeys and Superstore, rightly or wrongly. That's, that's what it is. But if, if everyone in this room decided they were going to sell the same as you would, do you mm -hmm. think you would you would have that market? Well, there must be uh, some are doing it, all right. But uh, there has to be a way of doing it m on a national scale that some farmers are able. To, well, like the hog board, or the, I don't know who was in fault when the plant was still running. He got these fellows from Quebec to run the system. Well, there were three farmers on the island: went natural and humane. And four more in the Brunswick. <coughs> they just got started. And they were getting a premium price for their product because they're a niche market. And this is the only way. We've got to go after some market that some of the large 
Yeah. Fellas like out in Manitoba, we were like at broke the, last year. We were at the Cattlemen's Association meeting the other night. There was a lot of talk about how they could meet, you know, specific cuts, specific brands for the cattle on PEI. And I do think that's the way to go in most cases. Yeah, the, far, the farmers' markets and those things are wonderful for a lot of farms. They do make good uh, return. For me, it was good. It, it, and it does work good for a lot. I don't think everyone could fit in there. But if you get, you know, with, you, you try to broaden and, and you're... But I do think that there needs to be a discussion on how we can increase the return for farms of all sizes, especially the small ones. We're bringing food all the way from Alberta to the Prince of Wales. Yeah. Beef. And we got better beef than they have, so the guy in Toronto was saying. Yeah. Okay. And then you're saying about the large scale farms. Down in Brazil, for gosh sake, they don't even need people in their tractors anymore. They got controls and towers every eight kilometers, 42 miles, or 42 kilometers long, or 42 miles, which I'm not sure what it was. And they were able to rotate that machine, the machinery. No labor. Yeah, and they have eight feet of topsoil, too, that we don't have. Well, <laughs> so I mean that we are going after these large corporations that are, don't have any regard for the family farm of any size, whether you're five, 50 acres or 3,500 acres. Yeah. And like I said, so, Horace, I'm not sure as, we're as far apart as you think on, on a lot of things. Yeah. Well, that's anyway. good to hear. I think we'll let the, the Federation take a rest. Uh, it is getting late, but I feel an obligation if somebody who hasn't spoken yet tonight and you made the effort to come, um, like to say some comments, uh, be more than pleased to hear with, speak with you, hear others. Um, we're going to, anybody? This room, this side of the room has been very quiet tonight. Uh, Gordon Vesey from York. No, no, no. If, you know, if we block off land at 3,000, 4,500 acres, when that farm sells, you know, it's gone to somebody, <coughs> maybe another part of the province, so that community is decimated. So I just don't see where they're coming from on that. Well, you certainly come from one of the most beautiful communities in Prince of Gal, New York. Um, David Ball? I guess so. I guess so. You had your hand up. <laughs> Finally prodded me up here. Uh, I'm not really going to go into, I, I, I spoke once before at the uh, North Rustico meeting in my own personal situation. Other than, uh, in, my, in my own situation, uh, my father and I are partners. We farm about 1,300 acres, 1,400 acres of land between us. Dad's 89 years old. Uh, He's had a stroke. Um, it's, it's very shortly going to be that I am going to be the sole operator of this operation. Uh, my business model is designed around that, that production that I have there. I have an organic, organic component in it, and I have uh, a, a low input component and a regular. But the point is, uh, I will be out of compliance the instant my father passes away or the ownership transfers to me. What do I do? Tell a third of my customers, uh, sorry, you know, go somebody else. Uh, sell off uh, one of my three combines. Uh, I, I'm not interested at 63 years old in, in looking for a partner uh, in taking the operation. I, my boys are happily employed out west. And, uh, and, and that brings me to the point of all the talk we've had about families and family farms. The reality is the family makeup today is so much different than the, than the family makeup that allowed family farms to form two generations ago. It, it takes a, a generation to make a farm, a generation to hold one, and a generation to lose one, uh, basically. Um, how, many, how many people in this room have children that they would recommend to uh, uh, put uh, to go on to a farm or, or into an agricultural program, unless 
uh, as was the case in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and, and into the 80s, children that were raised on the farm, and, and, and perhaps the families then had, had two, three, four, five, six children, uh, a couple of boys, uh, you know, and, and, and there was this typical stereotyping of, of breakup of, of how the families went, except for the Robinson family, they're, they're an exception. But the reality is, uh, today, the uh, uh, Nova Scotia Ag College, um, it's getting a little closer now, but three years ago, 70% of the students there were female, and they went into programs in biology and aquaculture and, and a whole host of things. Uh, David Mall, when he's looking for an employee, uh, is really challenged to find somebody uh, to, uh, I just had to give an employee a considerable raise to keep him from going out west. Uh, he makes more than I do, but that's the reality. The family farm has to, is a different style today than it was then, and, and a lot of family farms are incorporated, and, and so I, I'm glad to have heard some more definition in terms of business model, but the reality is a business model, if you're a family farm or small farm and, you don't, and yours isn't designed around a business model, you're not going to be around unless you've got a... a an auxiliary income to support it. So whatever the size, and there's room for all sizes within reason, uh, everything has to be based today on a business model. There's too much money involved. It's one thing if it's a way of life, and we've, we've invited the city to live out in the country, and uh, we're just fortunate that uh, the uh, city folk that move out in the country haven't all bought 30 or 40 acres, they've been content to by one or two or maybe five acres. But the reality is we're dealing with uh, a mixed community from one end of the island to the other. And uh, some of those pieces, of red marks on that properties map there, uh, I was responsible in former life. Uh, I sold some of those. And the reason, in, in, in large part, why the properties up on the east end of the island are so much bigger is because in the 70s you could buy a 50 or 60 acre piece of land that went down to the, the ocean for maybe $10,000. And that may have sounded like quite a bit of money because you might not got that from the LDC then, but you could get it from a non-resident. Uh, whereas the center part of the island, the people were, were developing in subdivisions. So it was a transition that went on. That has, I think most of those red marks took place in the 70s and the 80s, and, and very few of them in the last uh, decade. And in fact, it's, uh, it's reversing. So uh, I think we've, we have an opportunity here to uh, maintain a lifestyle on the island. Uh, and uh, it's not going to go back the way it was. But uh, if we can maintain it at a, at a level that's, uh, that's respectful for everyone that lives here, I think we've accomplished quite a bit. We just have to look at the rest of the world. Thank you, David. Anybody else would like to? Uh Make a comment. Uh, Carol? Okay. Yeah, just lower the mic a little bit there. <laughs> right. but when it comes to uh, this bigger, I guess, can they be looked at individually or does this all have to be uh, just one, about, uh, one okay, size fits all? Succession? Yeah, like okay. success. I'm thinking, yeah. can yeah. they be looked at in terms of a, a or somebody looking at it or does it all have to be in the act? As it, as it gets well, cert certain um, things have to be in the Act, and my recollection is that that isn't in the Act now. And it can be done by regulation, but one of the things that, in my opinion, needs to be looked at is this matter of succession. Uh, I have listened to too many painful stories at 12 or 13 meetings across the province, Carol, and uh, after little discussions afterwards, and the stories people are telling me, these are real stories. Um, you know, you weren't able to be in North Resco uh, the other evening, but David was very personal. And he, he illustrated very much how this has taken such a concern to him with Stanley being 89 and had a stroke and all that type of stuff. Um, I was pinned to the wall the other night in North Resco by somebody saying, and what will you do about it, basically? And, and I said, well, I think there are some things you can do about it. And one of the things is to give some discretion either to executive council or to the regulatory body involved and say that you would treat the estate as a separate legal entity for a period of time. 
not six or 12 months, John, you're entirely optimistic. <clears throat> You be, need to be looking at probably three plus years, or and then maybe get an extension on that. It, it, I know enough, Carol, that partnerships are always difficult. <clears throat> Corporation is basically a partnership. If you don't have the right partner, it's no good. There was one person in Kensington and his arms folded like this after the meeting, and he was going on this a great length. And he said, "Now, Mr. Carver, what are you going to do about it?" He says, my parents want out. I said, I'm just waiting for you to move your hand to see if you've got a wedding ring. And he didn't. <laughs> but he says, I do. But she doesn't want involved. Give kids. But 12 and 15. So, you know, I th and I'm not being disrespectful of women here, but I think in some ways the wife or the spouse today on a family farm mightn't want her name as a shareholder and as a director the same way she wanted 30 years ago. And so is there any other type of mechanism that the spouse can say, I don't want to be a shareholder for the legal liability, but because I have the right to own a thousand shares, a thousand acres, is there any mechanism here that my spouse and husband can carry on farming? I don't know, but somewhere along the line, we have to be creative and deal with these solutions. This act is 30 years. It's done quite well in many regards, much better than my throat. <clears throat> but I can tell you that my recollection of 30 years ago was this. When the limits were put in place, with one or two exceptions, and we all more or less know that situation, the limits that were selected really had no painful application to almost any of the firms in Prince or Island at the time. And, but one of the things that changed, never mind the size that the Federation is talking about, but one of the things that's changed, Carol, and you know this, is we've all gotten older. And somehow we have to be able to find a way for those David Malls of the world at only 63 to be able to carry on without his wife being involved in it now and his son's coming. And I'm not sure what those solutions are, but they have to have some type of creativity. And I think one of the ways is to give the executive council or IRAC discretion and authority to allow the estate to be taken much longer and treated as a separate legal entity. I apologize for the length of my answer. No, no, but that's it. There needs to be a, something okay. in place to we, sort of Carol, deal with We it. have to somehow, the, the same paintbrush in that particular situation, it's just like somebody called me up a couple of weeks ago and they were upset beyond belief because they weren't dealing with death. They were dealing with a situation <clears throat> of where their parent had dementia and they had no mechanism to deal with it. Like, the, the guy was beyond belief. He didn't know what to do. I took half an hour and talked to him on the telephone and reminded him that my, my free legal advice was worth what he paid for. <laughs> but, but, but thank you for your concern, because I've, I've listened to David a couple of times. Now, Morley Wood is swinging around. No, he was swinging. You're going to say something? I saw your hand up. Well, I'll give, going to give you, I'm going to give you a call. You, you, have a, you have a habit of saying things and tossing questions to me, but I'd like to toss them back to you. And I saw your finger in sort of before I saw Brian Turner. So which one do you want to go first? You want to go first? Bro, let Brian go first. Brian, you're up next. Brian, you're up next. <laughs> Who wants their finger in the pie? They mightn't want to have their name on it, but when it comes down to the final point there, they're, everybody's going to want their share. And? And, no, I just wanted your comments on it. You were just saying a few minutes ago that the ladies don't want in, but... No. There might be a come a time when they do want in. <clears throat> they may be. I, I'm just saying that... I'm not being critical, but I'm just saying that I've, I've heard enough it. stories to know that everybody digs into the, into the pot. Well, all I've had expressed to me on several occasions after meetings is 
that they wouldn't be, if their parent dies, they wouldn't be able to convince their spouse to become in part of the farming operation. Well, we won't go down any of those anyway, roads. Let's get back to, uh, I think our biggest threat on PEI is pollution. Okay. Like uh, some of the wells are using 80 feet of casing to get below the nitrogen. And glycosate takes 21 years to break down. We've got 40,000 acres of soybeans that they put glycosate on. It takes 21 years for it to break down. <clears throat> I don't know what percentage of potato farmers use glycosate, but a lot of them spray the, the grass in the fall before they even plow it. And I think we've got a, a bigger problem of pollution than anything on PEI when we really get down to it. I think it's a real danger. The average guy in Germany off the street that never seen a can of Roundup is five to 20 times higher of Roundup in his urine than the acceptable level of water in Germany. And in Germany, you're allowed to grow, you're allowed to use Roundup, but you can't grow Roundup ready crops. So we do both here, eh? So we, I try to get tested, but it seems impossible to get my urine tested. But I might have to go to Germany. But anyway, I might want to know when it does happen. But anyway, it's something we've got to be aware of. And then we're growing a bunch of corn that requires glycosate as well. And, uh, you know, it's a real danger. We haven't did any testing for that. Maybe we don't want to, but uh, something we want to look at. Thank you. Well, I think on that note, I'm going to use the prerogative that you gave me, Morgan. When you called me on the telephone a number of weeks ago, you said, I'll see you in Crackle. So I'll see you in Crackle tomorrow night. <laughs> but, yeah, no doubt. Uh, well, thank you very much. I apologize for the length of the evening, but uh, I uh, was trying to hem in the hall whether we have another meeting in Charlton. I think it's sufficient. This was our second meeting. And anyone who wants to come tomorrow night, I'm going to uh, be in Crapo. And people who are indicating they're presenting tomorrow night is the PEI Potato Board. Harry Baglow, he had an article in the paper the other day. He submitted, he's, he's already submitted it to me. And uh, he's going to be there. And uh, the Green Party of Prince Edward Island has submitted something to me. And then we're going to be in Wellington on Saturday afternoon. And if people want to make any representations or submissions, I'd like them to sort of have them done in the next uh, 10 days or so, send them in, and uh, then we have another process that I'm going to be undertaking here. And I wish to thank you if, the, if I had any doubt, as I said before, about the sincerity and the importance of land and water and other matters in this province. I, uh, I continue to be awed by how articulate uh, the residents of Prince Edward Island are. It's, um, Diverse opinions, ages, um, backgrounds, new residents, uh, whatever. Man, alive. Uh, we are talented with individuals across this province for a tiny province like this. And uh, I just want to say thank you. It's, uh, it's, it always exhilarates me when I listen to you. And I apologize for my voice tonight. And uh, thank you very much.